page of the hub. Um, if we could use the hands up facility, um, if we've got any questions, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. And we've also got a chat room uh, which is available and will be monitored and we will try and pick up any uh, queries, etc., cetera, that, uh, that come up or comments. And, and on that note, I will um, pass you over to our esteemed chairman, um, Mr. Uh, Wilson. Good morning. I apologise I was late because I was on another call. Um, and, you know, these things do happen. Uh, welcome. I appreciate we've got quite a few uh, additional people. Um, we've got a couple of extra virtual boxes of biscuits to go around to, to entertain everybody. Uh, we've got a packed agenda, uh, so it's important we stick to that. But we obviously always, as always, want to have some dialogue. So there is this sort of chat room that people can uh, put some comments down. Andrew is going to provide us with a uh, health and sort of design moment, are you not, Andrew? Good morning, Richard. Good nice morning. to see everybody on the call. Thanks, Doug, as usual, for everything you've done to prep for us. It's, it's massively appreciated what you do each time. Um, yeah, so um, the, the, the health and safety moment, health, safety and wellbeing moment I've chosen is actually something, um, even in lockdown, it's amazing what you can can find for material. So this was looking out the bedroom window where I currently work. Um, I had a, a hands-on or visual experience which I thought was well worth sharing because it brings in my mind us back to the point about why we do everything we do. What is it we're trying to ultimately change? Um, and so this is just something uh, that I thought might be of interest to you all in terms of the nitty-gritty. So can you all see a residential driveway there? Hopefully you can. Very nicely block paved, as you can see. The, the uh, hard landscaping people have done a very nice job. If you look up, there's a pair of windows up at the top there. Uh, that's where I'm sitting right now. So I had a very good view of all this work going on about two or three weeks ago. So they had a retaining wall to knock down. They cleared the site trimmed it all off and then started putting the block paving down. And I was so looking forward to this because I knew there'd be block cutting going on and heaven knows what, and I thought this is going to be smashing on all my work calls. And so it came to pass. So I'm sitting up in my room watching all this activity underway, which I'll get to in a minute. But if you look at what they did, they had this herringbone pattern block paving. They also had quite an awkward shape uh, in terms of the boundary that they had to uh, get it to tie into. Um, they had all sorts of little detailing. If you look at this in terms of the cuts that are required at the boundaries of some of this shape. So by no means were they working with whole blocks. And I reckoned even in that little shape there, uh, in those details, there was about 60 block cuts required to get that paving to fit to that shape using the herringbone pattern. And that was just over an eight meter length so I then look, started to look at the detailing of some of what they were doing as well. So even around a simple gully connection there, there's 10 block cuts required just to put that in. If you look, there's even two cuts there required for the gas pipe to come up. This was a little inspection chamber. I totted up here roughly. I thought there was approximately 16 block cuts around that. And then if you actually do an infill to a chamber lid, I estimated there were 38 block cuts just required for that. So at a rough estimate, I reckon there were 300 cuts required to individual blocks in order to put that in to that design. Um, and this is what it means with dry cutting. So they set themselves up with a nice little uh, rig there to get the chamfer they needed, the 45. If you look along um, the right hand side, you can see all the little gaps waiting for the little mitres to go into, little 45 degree mitres. And so here's the, some images just of, of that um, in progress. And you can see the amount of dust that's thrown up just by cutting one block. You'd also know the guy has um, no mask, no water, no ear defenders. Um, 
So all in all, quite an interesting thing to observe. So I sat here for a while watching this and I thought, no, Andrew, you've got to have a conscience about this. Let's go down and I'll have a chat with them. There were three of them down there and I had seen them on and off doing some work previously. So it wasn't completely a cold call, but I thought, God, you know, prepare yourself for this. You're going to get some bon honey off these people once you start raising a health and safety issue with them. So I went down and I said, oh, I'm up there, you know, there's a lot of noise. I know you've got to do this job and I'm noticing there's a lot of dust. I said, have you, has it been suggested to you, could you use some water with your steel saw? And maybe some ear defenders and masks. And they sort of looked at me and tried to de debate whether to hit me or just ignore me. But in the end, we got into a conversation and they said, well, actually, just around the corner, we've got a tap <laughs> and a bit of hose pipe. So we could actually wet the thing. So I said, well, how about that then? That, that might be good, mightn't it? So they, they duly went around the corner with the, with the template thing here. And, and there's a hose pipe, a yellow hose pipe leading to that little bit of water then that they sprayed onto the blocks. And off they went then cutting the rest of the blocks with this with this little device. You'll note that, you'll note that they continue not to wear uh, goggles or ear defenders or, or anything like that. But I thought I'll take a small, a smallish victory where I can find one. But um, I just thought I'd let you see this because this, I, I don't think I'm sharing the sound here, which I could do, but I think it's a problem with the buffering. But we'll ignore the fact there's horrendous sound with this, which was a thing I'd already been anticipating. Again, you can see down the right hand side here, all the cuts that they've got to make to make this thing fit because that's the way the design is. But if I just play this in, it's only brief. You get some impression there of the amount of dust that's kicked up, and that's from one block. You know, and the guy's obviously got his head down in the cloud of stuff as it happens. Um, and then, if I move on this slide, you'll see actually the slight difference, um, at least it made, with having a bit of water involved. So, this is a guy cutting the one once they've gone around the corner and got the hose pipe switched. So you can see there, it makes quite a difference. So what I wanted just to really highlight here is that simple design there, the repercussions of what it meant for the gang that were putting it in. And, and you might say, well, that's not a motorway, Andrew. That's not a trunk road. It's the principle I'm trying to make. In the fact, by not making it a highways England example, I've escaped all kinds of litigation that would be heading towards me right now by having raised it. But if you imagine we cut slabs, we cut curbs, all that stuff, often done by small and medium sized organisations that are subcontracting to main contractors who operate in this kind of world in terms of how they, they uh, do their approach to health and safety. And I just thought um, I'd put it there because we talk and talk about things and we talk about all our documents and our guidance, but at the, at the, at the at literally the cutting edge, that's the sort of thing that's happening. So I just thought I'd put it there as a health moment, really, uh, to see what others thought. Thank you, Andrew. It's very thought provoking, isn't it? Because, um, you know, from a design viewpoint, we, we could challenge, are, are those blocks actually the best solution? Could they be bought pre-cut? Could they, the uh, installer cut them in a sort of, more manufacturing engineering controlled environment. Um, the machine appeared not to have the uh, tilt guard working correctly on it. You can also hire in um, those still store saw cutters with um, extraction on and uh, damping already connected to the uh, spinning wheel, let alone the lack of uh, RPE, PPE, etc or consideration for have so that's fascinating isn't it there's, there's a comment being typed up i believe isn't it yeah printed blocks good one 
I, I think it's also worth noting as as well that the recent case uh, on one of the uh, Yorkshire North East schemes where uh, sort of anti walk uh, paving was used for so quite heavy duty paving. Uh, it it couldn't it was specified couldn't because of the weight it couldn't actually be got to the location it was required or because of limited access um, and then had to be cut up uh, into you know, into smaller pieces so it could be manhandled into place. Um, so you know, fundamental design issue there. No thought about access. No thought about uh, uh, actually inst installation. And then the, the the knock on impact of that was the fact that uh, it then had to be cut up and, and created dust issues. Um, and that was raised on a, a recent Yorkshire North East call, health and safety call. Yeah. And, and Tim's on the call, and, and we, we've all discussed previously the A14 and the, the paving under revetments, uh, revetment paving under bridges, um, which was to do actually with the manual handling issue in particular, and an injury there of handling the slabs. Doug. I think those slabs that you're talking about were about 45 kilos as well, weren't they? The, um, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, something pretty horrendous in terms of manual handling. But on the, on the when we use it for revetments, often that overbridge is on a skew, so all down both sides there's a cut involved in the slabs to get the slab to fit to the, the plan shape that's desired in the in the shade of the structure. So even there, in addition to the manual handling, you've got the cutting issue as well. So it, it is a live issue for us on, on highways projects. Yeah, as you say, Andrew, it was uh, not the uh, initial uh, motivation for the uh, the exercise to to investigate that, but it was uh, uh, an, another aside that came out of it. Okay. So that was brilliant. Um, I don't know if you if these slides will be shared, won't they, so other people can use that uh, for a, as a safety moment or a it, design moment. Yeah. 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 Okay. So just one point I wanted to pick up on the um, minutes to protect my friend Amy is uh, Amy uh, was put down with quite a few actions in the, in the minutes and, and I didn't um, review the minutes properly. So that's my fault, not Doug's, um, that she would um, action and follow things through. Amy is the conduit. A Amy can link. Can't you, Amy, speak, please? Uh, you can link. Yes, yes, I'm here. Um, link people within SES to help this group, but yeah. she physically can't do everything herself, nor does she have that sort of uh, time or, or skills. She, she's the conduit to link into the specialists within the world of SES, and mm -hmm. she's doing a fantastic job supporting this group and, and me and my colleagues elsewhere within the business. Uh, I think it's important I emphasize that point. So, um, so I, I have to confess, Amy, I do give your name to lots of people. I know, um, I know. I don't <laughs> mind that at all. I don't mind. <laughs> all right. Okay. Thank you, Doug. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we have 39 on the call. Um, do we want to do a very quick introductions? Uh, I know it's a lot of people to get through. I think um, it's important because we've got a few new players uh, coming along. So we've totally confused me anyway so with the 9.15 start. I'm Richard Wilson. I work for HE. I uh, head up the health and safety um, sort of lead for commercial and procurement. Doug? Oh, okay, my name's uh, Doug Potter. I'm a principal designer manager with Arcadis, uh, working across uh, quite a number of schemes, uh, Yorkshire North East and the Midlands for the uh, TA. Uh, I'll go through the uh, list as it appears. So we have Abby. Hi, uh, yeah, Abby Featherstone. I'm the head of design and technical assurance for Connect Plus Services on the M25. Thank you. Uh, Dave, Dave Avery. Hi, I'm Dave Avery from Acadis. I'm the Health and Safety Manager for Highways. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Tim, Tim Bowes. Hi, uh, Tim, you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, yes, good morning. Tim Bowes from Atkins, um, CDM Manager, and uh, currently involved with the A14 still. Thank you. Mike Boyland. Good morning, Tim. Morning, everybody. Uh, Mike Boyland, um, project sponsor, Highways England, um, working in the road design group. Thank you. Uh, Nick Boyle. Nick Boyle, technical innovation director, major projects and highways, currently helping the mobilisation of the plant motorway. Thank you, Nick. Uh, Claire Brown. 
Hi, Claire Brown. I'm a BAM Health and Safety Advisor and I'm RDP lead um, for Lynx Connects covering the Midlands and South East. Thank you. Uh, Paul's on hold. Uh, he did say he would have to drop out the call, so I'm assuming he's unavailable at the moment. But Paul Brown is with WSP, Principal Design Manager. Uh, Robert Butcher. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, I'm a, a, a CDM advisor with uh, Jacobs, uh, predominantly working on the A12 um, to A120 widening in Essex for Rip East. Thank you. Um, Andrew Finch, we've already heard Andrew, but. Uh... Yeah, so <clears throat> I'm the technical lead for civil solutions at, at Jacobs. Thank you, Andrew. Ed. Hi there, Ed French. I'm a principal designer manager with Arcadis, currently substantially involved as a CDM advisor for the design joint venture for HS2. Thanks, Ed. Uh, Jim Gallagher. Uh, it's, uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Gallagher. Uh, I work in Highways England, SES, and I deal with uh, structural standards. Thank you. Uh, so good. good morning. I'm Slagna Ghosh, uh, WSP in working in PD role or in few projects on Northeast. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim. Tim Goddard, Arcadis Principal Designer Manager, working on uh, TA auditing schemes and major projects, principal designing. OK, uh, Ken Harrison. Um, uh, I'm working in uh, Amy's Belfast office is principal engineer and assisting Paul Watson on the principal designer role on A66. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Jeremy, uh, no surname, apologies. Uh, yeah, Jeremy Blom, health and safety manager for NMCN, working on Area 7 and M621 in the RDP. Thank you. Uh, Jim Todd. Sorry about that, just having myself. This is uh, Jim Todd, uh, Temporary Works Director for Tony G and uh, Director of the Temporary Works Forum. Thanks, Jim. Uh, John Webster. Hi, yeah, John Webster for Kia, working on the as PD on the RDP projects and the High Speed 2 projects as well. Great. Thank you. Nicola. Morning everybody, Nicola Knowles from Arcadis, uh, Principal Designer Manager, working mainly at the moment on the technical assurance projects in the Midlands and the North, the Yorkshire North East. Thanks Nicola. Uh, Mark, Mark Lamport. Uh, good morning everyone, uh, Mark Lamport from Arcadis. Um, I'm the Principal Designer Manager, team lead on the M4, Junction 3 to 12 Smart Motorway. Uh, David Lum. Hi, yes, good morning. I'm David Lum. I'm the uh, RIP North Health and Safety Business Partner for Highways England. Thank you. Uh, Natalie Mansell. Morning all. Yeah, Natalie Mansell, the um, SMP North Health and Safety Manager for Highways England. Um, however, I'm, I'm leaving Highways England tomorrow and I'll be joining Atkins as of Monday. Don't go! <laughs> <laughs> so, morning everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, Mark Bridges. Yeah, morning all. I'm Mark Bridges, Health and Safety Lead for Galliford Tribe, but I'm here today as my capacity as hub chair just to give you an update on some of the work we're doing with the uh, Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group. Okay, thank you. Uh, Robert Mullen. Good morning, everyone. Rob Mullen. I work for Highways England SES in the Safety Risk Requirements team. Thank you. Um, Martin Partington. Now, Martin, you're on mute. Sorry. Um, uh, RDP North um, uh, Health and Safety Wellbeing Lead. I uh, also work on uh, the maintenance, Area 40 maintenance um, CHC uh, MR contract. Thank you, Martin. Pav. No pal. <laughs> uh, Pav Singh is, is with Arcadis, he's principal designer manager. I'll, I'll move on. 
Uh, Rob Eagles. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Rob Eagles. I'm a regional engineering manager at MGF, who are a supplier of Tempo Works equipment. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Robert Legg. Hi, Robert Legg, uh, working with Mark McDonald, uh, coordinating our principal design efforts. Um, at the moment, we're working on the M42 Junction 6, um, 428, uh, 3, 358, and uh, we were also interfacing with Highways England on HS2. Thank you. Uh, Leah? I think that's me. Uh, Saskia yes, Leah, I work for Arup, and um, I'm principal designer on the A120, and I'm also on the principal design team uh, with Belfer BT's role on the A63. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ian Scott? Yeah, I'm the lead for complex infrastructure program within HE, health and safety lead, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Roger Swainston? Uh, morning, I'm from Jacobs, um, CDM advisor, primarily on our RDP North schemes with costing. Roger. Uh, Tony? Tony Lewis. Uh, good morning, Doug. Uh, Tony Lewis, uh, Poskin, uh, Principal Design Manager for RDP North. Thank you. Uh, Toria. Good morning, Toria Thomas from Arup, uh, Principal Design Lead on the A417 and also our West Sub Regions Health and Safety Manager. Thank you. Uh, Nina. Nina Warminger. Spell mute. I should move on. Uh, James Washington. Morning, everyone. And the uh, safety advisor on the RDP, Wendy Harbour. Thank you. Uh, Lawrence uh, Weller. Morning. Um, head of engineering for network extensions in TFL. So managing the engineering on Northern Line Extension, Silvertown Tunnel and Barking Riverside Extension. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul Whitehead. Hi there, uh, Paul White, I'm Paul Whitehead. I'm from uh, Commercial Procurement. I am Design Services Category Lead. Just taken this role on uh, in the last week or so. Okay, uh, Simon Wilkinson. Morning, <coughs> excuse me. And Simon Wilkinson, Regional Director with ACOM, um, involved in the principal designer role on a number of highway schemes, um, a number of schemes for various other clients. Thank you. And Amy, who you've already heard from. Hi, Amy Williams. So I am the Head of Change and Technical Partners within Highways England in SES. Thank you, Amy. And uh, you've already heard from Richard. Richard, do you want to do the uh, Masters Rising? Um, from the last meeting, or shall I go through them very quickly? Go on, mute Richard. Sorry, I was talking to myself. Yeah, if you if you put, go through them, then I, I can sort of comment as necessary. Okay, um, we had a number of comments around asbestos management um, and the update of. Right, the asbestos management. I spoke to David Townsend um, regarding this, and um, the. Beginning of January 2020, GG105 was um, published. From an HE viewpoint, we have now produced a new standard following the publication of GG105. And currently, there is in draft a procedure that is being developed. There is an action plan, and they're looking at all the duty holders. This obviously affects uh, the operations team. The operations team now have a racy chart with their responsibilities that's been going through with the various uh, regional um, duty holders and training is being set up through our L&D um, teams. So there is some progress to report from that viewpoint. I think it's important to keep this item on the agenda as well in the future, Doug. OK. Um, we did briefly talk about Fit for the Future, which is an SES objective. Uh, or change program. Um, I don't know whether you want to comment on that, but um, um, I can comment on that. So, as part of um, the Fit for the Future program, we're doing um, sort of process improvement work and looking at processes. Um, 
that will work through all the processes in SES. So we're starting with a few pilots at the moment, but that will continue for the next kind of year, year and a half. It, it's not a kind of quick do it in 20 minutes. You know, it's a longer process improvement piece of work. Um, so that is working through. So you may see outputs of that and certainly people within Highways England um, will experience part of that as it moves to their teams. Thank you, Amy. Um, in respect to Network Rail, there was a comment around the, their use of design execution plans uh, and that it was a potential good practice opportunity. Um, I think as yet, the, the feedback, we've, we've not actually approached anybody from Highways, uh, sorry, from Network Rail on that, but um, that's probably uh, on the to-do pile, I think, probably Richard. Yeah, it probably is, but I know um, within lots of um, the design houses, that is, the, the design execution plan is already part of their management system. They may call it a different name, but they, they do actually have that. So. But it'd be interesting to find out what Network Rail's slant on this is. Thank you. Um, uh, there was a comment around health and safety implications uh, for data validation. Uh, and uh, we have got Jason Glasson uh, pres presenting later, so um, I well, would hope there'll be questions and uh, that issue will be covered as part of that presentation. Yeah. Uh, design for Health, uh, Liz Bennett mentioned that she had a number of examples um, around uh, good, good practice in that sort of area. Uh, I've subsequently spoken to Liz. Uh, she couldn't make the call today, apologised, but uh, she will be sending the examples through and I'll, I will include them in the minutes for good. this meeting. Um, the next comment was around occupational health research projects. So it was raised by PAV, um, and I think it was really just an awareness of what uh, what is happening and projects and initiatives that are happening within the group, uh, and letting people know because there's it's sort of an area uh, that we're possibly a little bit weak on. Um, PAV, do you want to expand on that? Uh, certainly, um, working with uh, Liz on other universities that are looking at this. There was a ne network, there was a rail event on health and well-being, and all of the presentations on health that they put in there are fully available until the uh, end of November. I'm going to put a link on here. So what, we, what we're actually asking for is if you know about any other projects that are taking place, to share information with us. I'll put a link, example, of about 40 hours worth of occupational health that RSSB have just done for, uh, over the past two weeks, it includes pain management, uh, occupational health, occupational health in design. Fair enough, it's a railways uh, based uh, guidance, but there's so much work that they've actually done in the background for design guides and everything else. Uh, I'll put a link on, please everybody take a look. Thank you, Pav. Um, there was a comment around the mental health task and finish group, but I think Mark, uh, Mark Bridges is going to cover that um, in the next item. Uh, we then had some comments, that I think it was from Paul Brown, around uh, the APS and uh, a piece of work they're doing around, uh, associated from project safety, sorry, um, a piece of work they're doing around competency and the guidance for competency. Uh, and I suppose it, it is a bit of an area um, that was tied to some of the RTBs. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that, Richard. I, I haven't been, I don't know anything about that at all. I'm sorry. Oh, okay, okay. Um, um, but one, one thing that, uh, uh, Tom's not on this call, but one thing that um, Tom and myself have been doing is through th um, Gordon Crick, is talking with Gordon Crick and um, Smart Motorways are going to be involved with Manchester University on the designer risk uh, treatment suggestion tools. Um, so maybe that's an item we can put on the next agenda and make sure Mr. Mary can attend that meeting to explain what's happening. Okay. I can volunteer him because he's not here for the meeting. <laughs> um, and, and I'm pleased to see in the chat that uh, there's a lot being promoted via uh, Syria and the good work that they've been doing. Which is important. Okay. It's, easy, it's easy to forget sometimes the work that Syria do. OK, thank you. So that um, just one other item I was going to mention. I, I will be doing a, a review of the circulation list. We've got quite a number of people on, on the circulation list, so I'll be sending an email out to everybody 
um, just to confirm if uh, everybody wishes to uh, still be on the on the list. I think we've got in excess of 100 uh, on that list now. Um, so moving on to, to item two, which is the supply chain safety leadership group and health and safety hub interface and uh, which uh, we've had a bit of a change around in the uh, uh, agenda items as Mark, Mark Bridges has to leave um, uh, shortly. So if uh, just bear with me a second, Mark, if you want to kick off and I'll get the presentation up. Yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, yeah, so morning, everyone. Yeah, so just um, in terms of a bit of an update, um, we are sort of uh, progressing quite well with the uh, high potential uh, focus areas that we sort of picked at the sort of end of last year. Uh, in fact, nearly all the common intents are in a position where, um, apart from supervision, um, they're all pretty much drafted. Uh, and there's quite a few that have been published and quite a few that are in the final throws have been uh, approved. Um, obviously, then what we need to do then is sort of develop the rest of the guidance which obviously in part, um, you know, the main focus is, is raising the bar documents, uh, but also there's going to be other bits of uh, information and uh, documentation that we want to sort of attach, which each each of these focus areas uh, are going to have their own dedicated page on the hub uh, and obviously links to them. Um, I mean, this is just <clears throat> obviously the, 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 the sort of outline um, plan uh, that we had for this year uh, as you can see quite it's quite busy a lot really though culminates in in this quarter four um where we'll sort of finish these you probably see it better on the next slide if you wouldn't mind just going to that please doug sure <clears throat> come through yep thank you uh, so as you can see there obviously we've got the uh, the focus areas on the left um and then obviously um, where we are in terms of um, publication. Um, so obviously the colours, uh, the greens are sort of indicating that we're on target to achieve um, those timelines. The, the sort of oranges um, probably a bit slightly delayed. Um, like I said, we, you know, in, in much of the common intent, um, so the, the, the way we are with um, the, the utilities, the IPV, the incident investigation, uh, and safety by design, they're all published uh, and, and so on, lost loads as well. That's also on the hub. Um, we're in the final throws of putting together the mental health uh, and the plant person interface. Um, I'll, I'll make sure Doug's got copies of these um, so you've got sort of sight of them. Um, we're, we're in the process of um, hopefully um, this month also having uh, the 60 mile an hour per throw through roadworks and the passport scheme, uh, common intent. Uh, documents ready for first review. Um, we, 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 I think previously, whilst passport schemes always been a focus area in a working group um, from the supply chain safety leadership group, I think at first there wasn't a consideration whether to develop a common intent, but I think given given where we are uh, and to provide a bit of clarity on expectation, um, we have started to draft something now. Um, so again, that should hopefully be uh, be ready for uh, review. So then obviously the hard work starts with with sort of raising the bar. Um, as you can see there, the, the, there's not just one uh, raising the bar to each common intent. There are a number to sort of put together. Uh, hopefully we'll have um, ready uh, for the final sort of uh, document is, um, is raising the bar 27, um, which which is, is final sort of review point now. Um, and then that should get published this month. Um, I think when we talked last month, there was discussion, there was sort of a viewpoint that perhaps raising the bar 26 wasn't required. Uh, and the view was because um, in nearly all of these uh, common intents, obviously the first point is to try to eliminate uh, source through design. Uh, so design features in nearly all the raising the bars to do with all the other aspects, but I took that sort of suggestion back to the supply chain safety leadership group um, last meeting and, and as you can imagine that they felt that there was definitely a need for a, a bit of a guidance note on safety by design so I've started to knock something together I've shared that with with Paul uh, I'll also share that with Doug so you can uh, circulate that it is very very first draft at the moment but if anyone's got any comments anything they think we, we need to add uh, obviously the common intent you know, pushes in the direction of trying to 
um, get better at uh, hazard identification, uh, obviously promotes the use of digital uh, and virtual rehearsals and um, the, the use of a, a, a design and um, manufacture and assembly. So if anybody's got some good examples, because I think that's what we're, we're really short of at the moment. I mean, you look at the, the principal positions working group, um, you know, the, there's, there's not much around DFMG uh, on, the, on, the, on the database. So if we can have some really good examples, I think that'll be that'd be great, please. Um, we've, we've, we've consciously only called it um, safety by design, I think, and I think I'd like to think from the last meeting that was here, uh, there is appetite for a health by design. Um, and I think it's felt that that should be separate um, so it doesn't get consumed by the safety aspect as health always does. So I think um, supplementary to, to what we do and how we support the supply chain safety leadership group, I think, you know, as a joint effort, both the, the hub and the, the principal designers working group could start to look to develop a health by design um, raising the bar, particularly after, you know, um, Andrew's safety moment this morning. I think there's, you know, we, we don't focus very heavily on the health impacts that some of the design decisions and, and, and constructability decisions we make. So um, well, that's pretty much it in terms of where we are uh, as an update. Um, yeah, apologies, Paul, there is a typo in there. there it should be 35. Um, not 25. Uh, Richard, you got your hand up? I have, I'm, I'm trying to be polite. Um, yeah, and, and there's a meeting, Supply Chain's Senior Leadership Group meeting on Monday, and we're proposing at that meeting that a um, common intent document is developed and raising the bar for GI activities because it's high risk activity. And um, we've had quite a few recent incidents. There is a huge design aspect that also needs to be built into that it's not purely you know the physical um, establishments of putting rigs on site and how you dig trial pits and detecting cables we've got to consider the design aspects of it because on one particular project they've had to actually move 60 uh, trial pits because the designers failed to recognize uh, the installation of certain utilities okay so there's a lot of work we can do to start improving, but it's impressive how we're moving forward on that. Mark, have you actually got enough support for developing the raise in the bar from people around this virtual table? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the heading of the title really, you know, I think there is a, a, a real appeal here because um, we probably do need a bit more support. I mean, you look at the, some of the names that are supporting there, it's either the same organisations or the same people. Um, you know, we want to make this, um, you know, very uh, inclusive. We, you know, we don't, we, we're not trying to monopolise anything here. I don't think that these people, it's, you know, we want more uh, collaborations. Um, so any support anybody can give. I mean, even if it's just cascading this information out and, and promoting it widely within your teams, that would be really beneficial because I think a lot of the times, you know, we, we, we put a lot of work and effort into these documents and then they sit on a website and, and perhaps aren't really used or referenced. Um, you know, and, and I think the proof will be in the pudding um, is is obviously the, the implementation of this and, and obviously using it, um, you know, our safety performance as, as, as contractors for Highways England is still very much, um, you know, we've plateaued to this this level, we've hit this permafrost, um, we've not seen any benefit yet of some of this work we've done. And I know it may take a lot of time because a lot of it is, um, you know, built around elimination and, and, and design, which we may not really see the benefits for a number of years. But there are some other aspects where we, you know, we, we, we have risen the bar in terms of constructability and we need to ensure that we're, we're adopting those now. Uh, but yeah, anybody, anybody who wants to get involved, we're not we're not exclusive. If people want to get involved, then we'd certainly encourage that, please. So please, can people think about whether or not they want to volunteer or maybe somebody in their team? Uh, would like to volunteer it's it's good for their development it's good for their development for chartership or for extra cpd points but it's also an opportunity to learn a bit more about the wider business and network for your career development so please go away and think about it and uh, either contact mark or doug or myself if you wish to volunteer for any of these exciting opportunities and they are exciting because you do actually end up looking at things totally differently and challenging yourselves. 
I think Nick had his hand up. Yeah, I was just I, I made some comments in the chat and I assume you're pulling on the document that Jim's done, Jim Todd's done, the stability guide with temporary work storm. That's got a number of case studies as well. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen your comment. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not aware of that document, but I'll certainly review it. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not our intention to regurgitate other people's work, but certainly, if there's good stuff out there, we want to be able to signpost that, just in case people like me that aren't aware of the TWF constructability guide, you know, it's 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 there front and centre uh, on the homepage. Been done over the years. One, most recent one is the Temporary Works Forum one, Jim Todd's chair, and then the one prior to that. Is the network layer safe by design group with a constructability guide and they both have good examples and case studies. Nick, sorry to interrupt you, but you sound very, very quiet. That's unusual for me. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say to me as well, Nick. So yeah, there's the the temporary works forum doing this constructability guide and and also you've got the network rail safe by design guide. Uh, I'll reference constructability as well, and it's integrating the methodology, which is why I sometimes don't like the word safe by design because people only think about the design, they don't think about method. Sometimes you can design something that may appear to be better, but it, then it involves 20 lifts because it's been built off site and it might be something that you need to make smaller so that it's assembled on site. Uh, and just on that, Nick, uh, Jim Todd will be. Uh, giving us an update on the constructability uh, report. Um, it's a, a later agenda item, so that uh, I've just been linking with uh, with Mark as well. And I'm happy to contribute any examples or case studies because I've got 12 years worth of it. Brilliant, fantastic. Appreciate that. Picking up another comment in the in the chat, I, I know uh, Pav's asked the. Uh, question about part of contract requirements. So, the the, the contractual requirements are raised in the bar so far hasn't changed. So it's still, um, you know, there was a major project instruction which was then written into CDF. Um, I'm assuming that will then have carried over into um, other contracts like uh, RDP and and, and SMA. Uh, there's also obviously for the maintenance side there was the. Uh, um, Area management memo or contract uh, contract management memo uh, in 2016, which again put it into contract. So they're still contractually required. I know Mark took an action um, because we're taking highways and badge off some of the new re revised ones and putting the supply chain safety leadership badge on. Um, what that meant to the the contractual obligation of it, but. The, the 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 bottom line of the supply chain safety leadership group and the hub is that we are technically a, we, we're a community we're a we're an industry sort of um, collective, so we we should be signing up to these, regardless of how how is England contract that or or make those mandatory, you know we should see these as as the minimum standards and the baselines that we all want to follow because it's the right thing to do really. Okay, thank you, Mark. Are there any other? comments no, no i don't want to stand on because uh, obviously i've gone first i didn't i didn't want to stand on i know there's a few people that are giving a presentation yeah. on some of these specific areas so i didn't want to stand on anybody's toes but i'll be around for another half an hour if anybody if you know if i can add any further detail to anything okay great thank you mark um the the next item um was again related to safety by design um and it, it really picks up on the presence, well, the comments presentation that Sean, uh, Sean Pidcock, uh, and Tom Merry uh, gave at the last meeting um, around a, a scoping study. Um, unfortunately, Sean and, and Tom couldn't be uh, here today. Um, Richard, do you, do you want to give us a, an update on that? I know not not a great deal has moved on, as far as I'm aware. But... Not a great not a great deal has moved on. Yesterday there was the HE Highways England Health and Safety Executive meeting with the exec board directors, and this topic was discussed there. Uh, Peter Munford is the executive director uh, responsible for this corporate activity, and he has uh, gone away to think about who can support Sean on this activity because Sean is now the um, director responsible for the delivery of LTC. So yes, things are happening in the background, but um, 
we, we need to have a bit more impetus behind that, and, we, and that's recognised. Okay. So I apologise that Mr. Mary is not available to talk for himself on this topic. Thank you, Doug. OK, uh, thank you there, Richard. Uh, we now have, have uh, an update uh, on safety by design by Andrew uh, talking about the common intent document. I'm hoping you can see that um, presentation. Yeah. yeah I'll, sh I'll show it off my screen, Doug, if that's OK, <clears throat> just so I can pace yes. it. Thanks. <clears throat> um, yeah, so um, this, this is a wraparound to, to what Mark's just been telling us uh, regarding the various themes running through uh, Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group, or SSLG. Um, what I thought I would do actually is just talk a little bit more about that group itself actually and, and why it exists, because I think for a few people on this call, it's probably still something that you may, you may have heard of, but not necessarily fully appreciate or understand its background. So just a little bit of context on that first before I go specifically on to the, uh, what's called common intent document for, for safety by design. So it really stems out of um, Home Safe and Well. So back at the beginning of the year, HE were looking to investigate new and emerging technologies and see how they could be used to reduce or remove risk where possible, uh, which is fair enough. And that's looking forward rather than, than backwards to say, you know, what else could we be doing? How can we uh, look at new, new things that are coming on that uh, we could benefit from in terms of uh, having beneficial impacts for construction operations and maintenance on highways. Uh, and they also said that uh, by doing so and involving all the stakeholders in the process, um, it would embed it, hopefully embed an improvement into uh, project planning and development of work and enable delivery of significant benefits and a step change in operational activity here. And, and that again relates to what Mark was just saying there was a sense that things had plateaued um, and, and was there a way we could kickstart um, a, a, re, a refresh, a reboot, if you like, of the whole agenda. Um, so in the short term of objectives, HE um, pointed to us uh, two or three things relevant to this discussion. So they're looking at governance uh, and having a steering group to involve the key stakeholders to, to implement um, the concepts of home self, safe and well. Um, very keen to review what was already there and how useful, effective it was in terms of identifying hazards uh, and looking at projects to perhaps, again, see if we could improve on the approaches to eliminating or mitigating those. Um, so they set about saying something with a smart objective was they'd get at least five innovation best practice pilots moving. And the outcome of that was that by, in order to do that, they needed to establish some working groups. So this is uh, really the root background to Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group. So Supply Chain Safety Leadership Group came about as an outcome of that. It's terms of reference, um, quite broad ranging, but essentially to provide strategic direction through the supply chain. Um, improving the discussions and quality of discussions between HE and the supply chain. So a lot of this is going to and fro. This PDWG is one of those forums. How do we actually make sure we're getting the value out of it and that we're not just churning over material without actually extracting uh, improvement on the back of that conversation? Uh, fundamental one there, which we would all be on board on. Uh, is also to think about operations and maintenance and road users and not just uh, construction. To try and make sure that if we are thinking of new approaches that we actually make them happen sooner than later, that they don't get bogged down in, in too much uh, validation and too many people wanting to review something before anything actually happens. So try and make it an efficient and fast moving imperative to get these things going. Um, and as as when things issue, happen out on site, can we uh, can we resolve those and resolve them fairly quickly? So again, I just go back perhaps to the A14 item and this whole discussion which Tim Bowes set off uh, in terms of looking at revetment paving, for example, uh, and how we might go about doing something about that. And on the back of that, we actually released one of the whole life design 
uh, prompt sheets for designers about the issues they could think about in, in relation to that. Um, very much about sharing innovation uh, for the benefit of everyone. Um, Nick, Nick Boyle's stuff and the stuff that you do, Nick, through through BB's engineering group is fantastic because it gives us as designers tremendous insight as to how um, contractors work, how they approach actually delivering what we're designing. Uh, that kind of material, the stuff that I, I absolutely endorse anything that uh, is said about Syria that praises their materials. Uh, and on the back of that, the sort of thing that Jim's doing for constructability. So there's loads of good stuff out there. It's just about trying to to make people aware. And I was having this conversation internally with some of our health and safety people yesterday. There's so many people, as we constantly say, fresh into the industry, who've never been on a site. We need to at least give them access to the things where they can get early um, knowledge uh, and, and learn from those things, experiences that the rest of us have, have had to learn the hard way. But the, the ultimate point really was out of all this, under the terms of reference, was to create these common intent documents, which would show an intent across the supply chain about how we we're going to actively approach um, improvements in health and safety uh, and well-being. So that overall leadership group um, looks a bit like this. It may have changed slightly. Mark would be able to tell us straight away whether this is still quite appropriate, but it, it gives you an idea of um, how was England sitting in there quite substantially, uh, albeit really as a sort of uh, overseeing uh, parent, if you like, Richard, I guess, because obviously they're not supply chain, but they're embedded in um, supply chain safety leadership group to make sure we're steering things in the way our ultimate client wants them to go. Uh, and then a fairly diverse mix of people from uh, contractors and designers to make sure that we were getting a reasonable presentation across the supply chain. So, so that's the, if you like, the the overarching uh, CSLG. Um, and where they were going was to adopt some common approaches. So applying the principles of prevention, which clear enough, CDM, uh, but having a set of common standards that we were all working to. And I say common intent here coming out again in what was uh, wanted to be embodied in anything that SCSLG produced, that we would all be doing the same thing and that we would go with absolutely driving these messages home. In other words, we were committing to them as a supply chain. Raising the bar still to sit there. A lot of people have said, well, where does raising the bar sit? I noticed in the chat, I think it was Pav or, or someone this morning was saying, is raising the bar embedded in contracts? I think the issue was raising the bar was intentionally only guidance, um, but it seems to have been adopted more and more as if it is a contract requirement and written into specifications and things. I think we're trying to backtrack from that, my understanding, and again, Mark can tell us a bit more after I've spoken, but um, that, that it is intended to be guidance. The common intent might well be embodied into the contracts, the saying thou shalt adopt the common intent. Um, but raising the bar principally is to try and get a pool of good material there and not to have people tripping over saying, well, have you met raising the bar guidance number 72B? That's not really the intention. But the intention is to get some good practice out there and get us all adopting it as best we can. And then the thing was to make sure that these principles of these uh, so-called common intent documents were actually uh, getting implemented. <clears throat> so say the common intent was a fundamental outcome to be uh, had out of the supply chain safety leadership groups activities. Uh, and there were a number of strands that these working groups uh, looked at or are looking at, and Mark's just given us a bit of an update there. Um, several of these now have their common intent documents already uh, uh, published. Um, incident investigation, lost loads, which actually doesn't appear on there, I don't think. Interestingly, strike avoidance is IPV strikes is uh, and a couple of others that are coming online shortly, uh, mental health uh, and safe use of plant. But I'm here to talk particularly about the one for safety by design, uh, which is the one I, think, I guess of most interest to this group. But as has been said earlier by Mark, most of these embed some kind of design, design a consideration in them. Uh, in what we're going to see in those common intent documents coming from other groups. Certainly, I know um, safe use of plant. It, one of its key principles is about designers considering the use of plant and allowing enough adequate space 
on sites for them to, to get the necessary plant in and out, for example. <clears throat> so looking at the common intent documents themselves, this uh, just gives you an idea of the format. Um, when it comes, it's, there's a bit of a lag on the presentation, excuse me, there it is now, you're just seeing it. Uh, so <clears throat> they're two-sided, all of them. They have a consistent structure, as you can pretty much see there. Um, and uh, two or three, four of these already published. So, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> for the one for safety by design, um, John Dixon, who sits on the parent SDSLG group, well, was the chair for our working group. I took the role of coordinating um, everything in terms of our meetings, etc. And as you can see, we've got a mix there from designers and contractors. And I have to say, it was a it was a pleasure working with this group. It was highly collaborative, uh, a lot of good challenge. Um, and in fact, the outcome, I don't think there was anybody at the end of the day felt uncomfortable with, with what the uh, Safety by Design common intent document was saying. So in the structure of the documents, you always get a background piece at the, at the very start. Uh, and, and the main thing out to draw out of the one for Safety by Design is the start of the first paragraph. Many, if not all, incidents have causal factors rooted in early design decisions. I know we talk a lot about this in safety by design workshops and things, but it is absolutely the case. Um, so it's not telling us anything new, but it's emphasizing the fact in case anybody's in any doubt. And then the start of the third paragraph. So establishing safety by design as a mindset in project and program teams with everyone routinely reaching decisions and developing actions to suit is critical to achieving safer outcomes. Um, for construction workers, operatives, maintainers and road users. So those are the, really the key points out of the background. After that, you get a vision statement. Uh, so for this one, clearly it says that by uh, the vision is to have a safety by design culture that just runs through the whole life from the very conceptual stage of a project. We're embedding this mentality in the design chain. Um, and trying to adopt pretty much a default mindset of designing for off-site manufacturing assembly. And I'll come back to that because Nick's already raised a point which is very much a common theme that comes back from the contracting community for us in that regard. And then there's the general principles behind the common intent document itself and basically a commitment to say we'll adopt the following approach. You then get in each of the common intent documents this diagram. The one, two, three, four, five element of it varies depending on what the common intent documents subject matter is. So for this one, it's heavily loaded, if you like, before site works commence, which is where the, the sort of turquoise dash line is there, really. Um, so it's really saying we'll go with the eliminate, isolate and minimise the hierarchy uh, of the uh, principles. Uh, and so for us, again, if you go down the right hand side, this is the key key summary, really, of what this common intent's about. Establishing safety by design mindset. Um, we will share, capture and share information through a digital delivery means. So using the PAS, BIM PAS to share information. And again, that can be a challenge for small and medium sized subcontractors, etc. Uh, but the idea is we, we lead through uh, through the main contractors and through the design community to do that. And we need to somehow make sure we support and bring on board SMEs um, over time, uh, adopting DFMA as far as we can. And then it goes on obviously to go through the fact that where we can't eliminate, we'll, we'll try and at least mitigate to the best of our capabilities. And we will use virtual rehearsals. So this is 4D design processes and, and we've had a good share of uh, Balfour's actually of them doing this for uh, uh, Thames Bray Bridge on M4 as far as part of the Smart Motorways project there, which Mike Fowler from this group shared with us um, and, and then sent us photos of the actual weekend closure when they, they put the beams in and, and they had hold points. So they mocked up in 4D the whole bridge lift and, and the working space, etc. And then they said, well, if we if we have an issue in this first stage, we can have a hold point here 
pull away and we'll have to go back on a subsequent weekend closure. So all that was was great learning to see uh, coming through from the contracting community and I'd encourage all contractors to, to let us be able to uh, see those to learn from them. So when you stand back on the second page, it goes into more detail about those principles. Um, and uh, if you haven't already seen this one, um, you can find it on that safety hub along with all the others. Um, so if you go onto Highway Safety Hub um, and you go through the, the front page there, um, you'll find that uh, the second icon in at the top left there is the one for the SCL, SCSLG. And if you click on that, you get the lower screen there, uh, which uh, then takes you through and doing that, you'll find the common intent documents. So uh, that's a, a quick run through, a bit of background to SCSLG for those who are less familiar with it, and also about the structure of common intent documents, um, um, particularly the one for safety by design. Thank you for that, Doug. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Um, are there any uh, particular questions. Um, I'm seeing it in the chat, but um, while we've got, uh, oh, thank you, um, Lawrence, you got your hand up. Yeah. Um, thank, thanks for that. Very really good presentation. Um, one point you made was about perhaps changing the culture a bit, so people are asking the safe by design questions you know, more regularly and as a matter of course, rather than having to be prompted for it. Have you perhaps any more thoughts about that, how we can start getting that ball rolling more often? Yes, I think that um, the, real, the real commitment behind this comes from the top down. So it's people like ourselves driving it in our organisations in practical terms for me. I think the thing that always seems to make the most difference for early careers people uh, is using safety by design uh, workshops to give uh, early careers people the principles behind what it is they, they, they're obliged to do, uh, not just ethically but legally through um, the CDM regulations, but to do it using practical examples. So ideally, um, sort of schemes that they're working on. So when I've, when I've run them and others have run them, I know at Jacobs, um, we've prepared course materials based on examples that we can show in terms of how a design evolved uh, and what considerations did do or should have gone into to what was designed. Um, and uh, I tend to try and draw down examples from site where I've had contractors point out things to me that we designed in and, and it had never really struck us as designers. Um, and when you went back and look at it from the contractor's perspective, you suddenly realise the issues it was raised and, and quite, might well do as an outcome beyond construction. So there can be issues, a lot of issues for operations and maintenance. And I know Martin Partington's just flagged that up in terms of 4D. Do we actually go on to say, and how's that going to be maintained at the end of the day? Um, so I find that the workshops, the interactive workshops are probably one of the best ways, uh, Lawrence, that, to get this thing embedded. Um, and it does rely on people with experience being able to point out the sort of examples that people should be looking at. And what I said earlier is signposting them to things like the Syria guidance uh, and other material that they could go and look out uh, to, to get them to start thinking about it. And I think CDM advisors have a lot of an important role to deliver here in terms of being mentors along the way at design risk review workshops, etc. Uh, but I think it's practical engagement, particularly for those who haven't been on site much or haven't got the experience of knowing what an activity actually looks like. Just quickly, one thing we, we have started to do ourselves is just little snapshots from site. We call them postcards from site and it's just taking out a little video camera like you get cycle helmets these days. Very simple device but actually just filming an activity on site. And I think I might have shown it at a previous work, workshop, working group meeting. One was on smart motorways, where clearly you have this incredibly tight corridor to work with, which is really in effect your whole road. And you're actually then trying to build something on your whole road. Um, and once you start swinging, say, a boring rig that's putting in the piles for a VMS sign, 
how do you swing that when it could be going over lane one, which has live traffic running in it at, well, ideally at 50 or 60 miles an hour, but frequently at 70 or 80, just the other side of the temporary barrier. And what does that mean? And getting getting uh, designers to realise what working space requirements and slew angles and things actually mean in practice. They go and design a VMS using a, 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 a cut and fix piece that's nicely prepared for them as a design package. They bring that in. Great job done. Go off, make themselves a coffee. I've had a good morning's effort there. Uh, I'll go on to the next thing this afternoon. Never even thinking what it actually means in terms of things like rig placement and access and the whole road. So the only way you can really get that across, I think, Lawrence, is to demonstrate it through active workshops and active design reviews. Yeah, I, th I think you've got a few really good um, examples of things we can do, you know, back in TFL. I really like the idea of the postcards from site. Um, we, we've started to do some of the virtual safety tours. Um, but may yeah, maybe bringing the engineers um, in to have a look at a video from site um, is a good way for them to start thinking about OK, this was how it was designed and this is how it's being implemented. So changing the mindset in that way. Yes, and I would just encourage you to to share anything you get, because we all get ingrained thinking. Uh, yeah. and, and so, you know, lateral thinking comes from seeing what others are doing, perhaps in other disciplines. We're just starting to look at the design close calls process that Network Rail use um, mm. to flag up issues that could have uh, been better dealt with in the design process uh, and could even, even have actually resulted in some uh, significant incident and learning from those. It's like a near miss process, isn't it, in the design stage of, of network rail projects. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of learning we could bring into Highways England uh, and the Highways community generally. Yeah, we're that thinking means. about that as well in TfL, actually, is how we would launch that in TfL. Yeah, I think we should pick it up as a theme. Maybe the two of us could just do a bit more research on it uh, and yeah. maybe do a presentation on it, Lawrence, at a future yeah. call. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Sounds good. Uh, there's a comment in the chat from uh, Robert uh, around uh, yeah. BS6188. Yeah, it's a process that sort of um, uh, certainly our colleagues in power and, and nuclear are using to look at their designs and um, I literally become, became aware of it sort of late last week. I'm just wondering if anyone has any uh, background with that uh, BS uh, assessment process. No, I don't personally, but I, I'm, I'm very happy to hear from others on the call. It's a sort of HAZOPS approach by the look of it, Robert, is it effectively? Exactly, I know we, yeah. We use yeah, that yeah. On, I remember using that on Hinkley Point C. And, um, yeah, something else that we talk about on these calls. I think Mark, Mark Ramport, I think you've talked about this in the past and others. So I'd like to open that out to the group if we can. Yeah, I'm not sure it was me, Andrew. Um, just thinking back. Right, OK. I know that past working group meetings, we have talked about HAZOPS uh, and considering operations as part of the designers review process. Apologies, Mark, didn't mean to put you on the spot there. <laughs> as I say, I'm, I'm not at all, unfortunately, and should be by the sound of it, familiar with 61882. Uh, Robert, so I shall go away and have a look at that after this call. Yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I'm yeah. researching it as well at the same time, but um, yeah, I mean, just trying to work out if it's something that we actually do or sort of something that we can improve our offering with. Um, if not getting accreditation, then sort of working towards the, um, the the philosophy of the British standard. Yeah. To be fair, um, in highways though, Andrew, we we do have the operational safety role when we're yes. designing. Yes. Yes. No, absolutely. Associated with it, so. To be fair, I think it's we get we get those uh, views from different viewpoints, don't we? Yeah, no, absolutely, Nick. We do get the operational road safety reviews and and um, and the GG one hundred and four assessments, etc. Um, I think it is actually it is there. Yeah, I mean, so the, the feeling was that we probably arrive at the same result probably by a different <laughs> different route, but yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe there is learning in there to sort of um, um, improve improve the final product. But yeah, I know we've certainly done it on more buildings orientated 
So Heathrow, we've had specific reviews where we've ended up doing 4D modelling to show how we would um, take a, a, a substation in and out when it needed replacing in 10 years or 20 years time. And we've had to carry out those reviews to prove that it could be done for those awkward pieces, yeah? Yeah, actually, that was uh, that was interesting. Just going back to Inkley Point, uh, Nick, I remember we were designing on the back of a model which was already existing down at Flamanville in northern France, and they'd had exactly that issue. They hadn't designed for how they'd eventually have to change a piece of kit after 10 or 20 years. And yeah. it, would it would mean removing a whole wall, basically, because they hadn't designed in the fact that you need to maintain it at some point and replace it. Similarly, we've done that with escalators and things like that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the whole O and M and replacement strategy thing is, is still something we we need to do more on. I think, and also I like Paul Whitehead's comment again, just going on about the access and plant simulator as a way of looking at slew circles and things like that. I've seen a lot of static stuff, but I know the plant suppliers do have some good material out there, Paul, don't they? I don't know if you're uh, available just to comment on that. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, the, plan, the simulator industry has, has moved on uh, greatly. There's, there's a couple of real big players, and, and the accuracy of, of the um, uh, training simulators is brilliant uh, now. Um, and the ability to actually, they're, they're coming along now, building the ability to just build a site as we would. You know, as as we would uh, view it, you know, we asked them probably uh, nine months ago, could you build a, a smart motorway site? And they said, yeah, yeah, we could. Yeah, we could kind of model that. And that would be really, that's a really good, good view of you can get people just walking in front of it. You can you can have vehicles just passing by the side of you. So it just gives a real appreciation without actually getting out there, actually just seeing what the, and actually having a go at it, you know, if you can get, I'm sure the plant communities would be really, those people who have them already would be up for giving um, some of the uh, more uh, sort of you know, designers a go on them, but just to give the appreciation of <laughs> actually how you construct stuff and how we get there uh, rather than, than just being on a piece of paper. So no, there's a lot of work being done there uh, currently uh, to try and get better training through simulators. Yes, excellent point. Actually, it, it brings brings in another point that Nick mentioned. Actually, as well, we got the. I think I think these are all good uh, devices for us to learn as from as designers. The the one caveat I would put on the back of it is that we don't then become overly prescriptive uh, in what we then tell a contractor they have to use. So we can't we shouldn't be saying and you must use this piece of kit or if we're using DFMA you must have prefabricated this exactly like this because that actually takes out the innovation and the flexibility and the best working practices that contractors have themselves to come along and actually modify those things slightly to like Nick says you could have a piece of stuff you've designed up very nicely and built in a factory and then you can't actually get it to the site that it's got to go and fit on so <clears throat> we need to be careful we don't actually um, ring fence uh, what what contractors can then go on to do, but in terms of getting learning, I think it's an excellent device. And thanks for putting it forward, actually, Paul. I think it's a, a lot to learn from that. Okay, thank you, Andrew. That was uh, very thought provoking and, and raised quite a look uh, number of, of questions. Uh, so thank you very much, and for everybody else who contributed there. Um, we now have an update from Chris G around uh, utilities avoidance. Um, Hopefully, Chris, you're. Uh, I'm here. Still yeah, on morning, the call. Dan thank you. And everyone else. Morning. Thank you. Um, this is just going to be a quick verbal update um, on what I'm doing in talking to the utility companies. I know I've um, given a bit of a presentation before to some of you, so I'll keep this fairly brief. Um, although I didn't actually have a sort of slide deck to pre to present, um, I'm just going to put something on the screen so we're not all looking at a load of our initials. Um, and this is an earlier slide that didn't make my sort of final cut. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I'm here as head of utility diversions for Highways England to start to engage a little bit better with some of our utility partners. Um, they don't like being seen as a part of our supply chain as such. Um, 
they like to be seen as partners and uh, what we need to really start to do with them is engage with them a little bit more strategically uh, and share our forward program with them. Obviously, we've got a lot of work we need to be doing uh, going forward and uh, we're really at the moment just dealing with them on a little bit more of a sort of piecemeal approach on a project by project basis. Uh, and it, the, the intent is that if we can share our national program with them, it gives them more of an opportunity to see the pipeline of work that we're going to be needing them to do. They kind of get that. Um, broadly, they are receptive to that approach. This is a bit of a, a supplier relationship management function, um, for want of a better word. But also, it's to really start to explore, well, where's the there's more efficiencies in doing things? Because obviously, they're busy doing their own capital program of work. Sometimes that clashes with our program of work. Uh, how can we see where there's opportunities to do that better? Um, and how can we actually identify potential issues? Because we may be asking them to divert multiple gas mains um, for different schemes all in the same you know congested part of their networks where they may not be able to have the flexibility to accommodate all of that work in one calendar year so we may need to shuffle our pack a little bit um, i think our first challenge um, as i'm sort of showing on the slide is there's just so many of them we can't possibly talk to all of them um, and actually that that's probably not an efficient thing to do anyway, but we do need to target some of the key players. So actually the first thing we've really got to get a handle around is what does our national program look like? Yeah, fine. We know what, you know, broadly when we're going to be doing some of our big programs, but we can't articulate to some of the utilities. When does that mean they've got to be moving assets? Fine at a project level, but maybe not at a sort of programmatic approach. So we need to get a handle a little bit firstly on what does the program look like for individual utilities? What's the spend? Um, and what is the risk exposure? And if we've got that data, that should open the doors to getting their attention a little bit more. They do actually, I know they're frustrating to deal with sometimes, uh, but they do want to support us being successful, albeit they've actually got their own work to do and actually we're making their life pretty difficult because we're asking them to interrupt their customer supplies to divert assets that they weren't planning on diverting. So this is as much about helping them be successful managing their own program as much as it's about making sure that, you know, they know when we're going to be needing them to plan works and they can put it in their own capital programs. Um, so I'm putting an engagement plan together for us as a business at the moment. What, what I have done is started talking to sort of 10 or so of them. And that's that list of 10 is a bit subjective based on um, some of the key players. You know, you immediately know I need to be talking to Caden Gas, for example, um, um, and Western Power and UK Power Networks just because of their their stretch. Um, but also it's based on if I'm hearing this particular challenges with one or two of them. It's an SRM piece, as I said, and it's also to sort of target efficiencies. A couple of points probably really just for this um, group. Um, we they we tend to have a very sort of formalized engagement with them at the moment on a sort of project level. So you would traditionally go to a developer services part of their business, who's the sort of outward facing group, um, you'll get an asset plan from them. You'll get a, if we're using the new road to street works parlance, you'll get a C3 back from them, maybe a month later after asking for it. And that's just a red line on a piece of paper and a cost that you could take with a, with a hefty pinch of salt. And you could wait a month to get that service back. And that doesn't always necessarily give us the intelligence that we might need when we're looking at um, some early scheme development or just trying to understand if, if we did a project, 
what what one it look like in terms of moving their assets. So, um, and but they're all fairly locked down in. This is this is how we face out to the external world. You put an application in for a sort of budget inquiry, and we'll come back to you in a set period of time, and it will look like this. And they've all got quite different ways of working, and different. Um, information that they'll provide back. What I started doing is talking to a few of them while I work out a program to share and put under their noses. What I've said to them is, look, we actually need a bit of a better service, please, from you. Um, we need to, to have something that kind of fits a little bit better into what our, our need is uh, in terms of our engagement. And can you actually give us almost like a, a pre C3 service possibly in nominating some folks in your developer services group that you know who might be able to be a bit more engaged rather than just stand at a cold send us a cold letter that doesn't actually give us what we need can we pick up the phone to someone can we have someone on point who can actually give us a bit more of an informed conversation yeah we've actually got a primary substation there and if you want to do that project um, we would have to move it and straight away I can tell you that's three years of engagement, you know, having data or intelligence like that early in a scheme development could actually help us quite a lot. There's a number of challenges around that because they don't like to be seen to be giving us a preferential service, and you know I totally understand that. Um, there might be some uh, debate to be had about, well, look, we're not a you know standard house builder here. We're not a Tesco's development asking for a new roundabout to be put in. You know, we have got a bit more of a national imperative and actually we need to find a way to make this work a bit better, please. And it's as much about avoiding moving their assets in the first place, if we can, uh, as much as, you know, getting a better service from them. Um, and yeah, there's, there's an, a number of issues with that. A few of them have gone away to have a think about it. I probably need to articulate back to them what that might need to look like. Um, and however we then roll that out uh, amongst ourselves and how we could do that, I don't know, but it feels like that's an opportunity. Um, and then probably just also for this group really is just some of the safety initiatives. So although my engagement with them, I'm, I'm in a team of one, uh, is to talk about, look, here's our national program. How are you going to set yourselves up to help us here? What I do want to do is sort of have a conversation with, look, how can you help us in uh, some safety initiatives? Um, you know, we, uh, you know, it's a, it's a reality. We do hit your assets. Uh, we, as in, I mean, collectively as a group, it happens. Um, they hit their own assets as well, so we're not. It's not finger pointing exercise uh, in any capacity, but it's look. How can you, with your uh, knowledge, help us a bit better? So could they, for example, step into this community and help us with some better uh, understanding of working safely around their assets or where their assets might be? Can they help us with? you know, um, site visits um, to understand why it is they need so much space in the first place when they're diverting their assets. You know, it's a common theme and it's a common challenge. How can they help us better with um, asset knowledge uh, and availability and access to that data? Um, a lot of them will signpost us to their website saying, yeah, working safely around our overhead lines, all the guidance on our website, yeah, that's fine. You're fulfilling your obligation. That's great. We know that. But actually, can we, rather than just relying on a, ex, you know, your website, can we actually have you stepping into our community to talk to us about that in, you know, better detail so we've got some clearer understanding here? It's about seeing if we can pull them in to help us. Um, these are just some ideas I'm sort of knocking about. I've talked to one or two of you about it. Um, it's something it feels like we've got an opportunity to maybe do that. One or two of them 
have actually started thinking about that as well and actually come back to me with some sort of early tentative ideas. Um, I don't know how to shape that. I might need to call on some of you to help me with that if if we think there's some there's some merit in doing that. Um, so I'm probably going to sort of stop there. It, it's all sort of best endeavours, lots of good intent at the moment. That I haven't got a lot of tangibles uh, to bring to the forum, but um, yeah, that's effectively where I've got to at the moment. Uh, and I'll probably stop there and just take a couple of questions and then I'll probably have to sort of jump off the chat. Thanks. OK, thanks, Chris. Um, the question, well, a comment from Nicola uh, around uh, Utilities understanding of principles, preventions, and our problems, uh, clashing, uh, the implications of clashes with uh, our works. Um, do you feel it's sort of a two a, a two way thing there, Chris? That, that they do understand that the problems that we have. But, uh, um... They do, and they don't. Um, I'm not sure their thinking is really that joined up. They tend to react, be quite reactive. So uh, a scheme will land on their desks and they will purely look at it from a, all oh, right, we're being asked to move something and um, they'll just then, here you go, here's the cost of moving it and it would look like this. Um, I, I sense that sometimes from my own experience of delivering projects where we've had to get utilities moved in the past, that there's sometimes um, maybe a bit of a, not reluctance, but um, they don't quite uh, consider fully that there might be an opportunity for us to design out the clash so that they don't have to move their asset in the first place. Um, you know, I, I don't know what that looks like. Can we raise the level of the road and put their assets in a protective culvert so we don't have to move them? Yeah, I don't know. That's just an illustrative example. Um, I do feel like we do need to pull them into that conversation a bit more and actually start to raise their um, raise that with them. Uh, there's probably multiple examples of where they do do that already, and but I suspect there's a few examples of where they don't. Um, we don't want to move their assets. Uh, you know, we are looking at spending hundreds of millions of pounds in the next five years having to do that. Um, ideally, I, I feel like Mikhail Gorbachev in that I should be doing myself out of a job and we shouldn't be moving any of their assets. Uh, that's not going to happen. We are going to have to move a number of them. Um, it's really just trying to see if we can get a better service to avoid it in the first place or be do it in an efficient manner. Uh, I might not have completely answered the question there, so apologies. OK, thank, thanks for that, Chris. Um, there's a, uh, well, Mark Lamport's got his hand up. Uh, yeah, just wanted to add a couple of um, of comments. Firstly, thank you very much, Chris, for a really uh, useful uh, and interesting update and really good to see the progress that's being made. As you know, I've got a particular interest in this and it's great to see the engagement piece uh, uh, you know, coming along and, uh, and moving forward. Um, just a couple of things I just wanted to add is that um, raising the bar nine um, utility avoidance uh, revision four was published in October so mm -hmm. just to make the group aware that uh, there's a new version of uh, of that uh, RTB um, available it's got some good stuff in it so uh, please um, uh, have a have a look at that um, something I read in construction inquirer very recently end of October um, was that the, there appears to have been an increase in cable strikes uh, by something like 20% during the um, COVID-19, since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic um, landed on us back in March. Not really clear why the, that increase has, um, what, the, what the cause is. I suspect that supervision, I think, has, has uh, has reduced as a result of the uh, of, of the lockdown and and uh, and I'm sure there are other factors but I think it's an interesting um, an interesting statistic that we've seen that that significant rise in cable strikes I'm not sure whether highways England have seen that sort of rise and whether you've got any um, figures Richard to to comment on that 
Um, and and lastly, um, you raised um, Chris about designing out the need to divert, and and that's certainly something that we've um, strived very hard on the M4 smart motorway to uh, reduce the need for um, diversions that save time uh, and money. But it needs information in order to be able to do it and time as well in the in the design evolution. So diversions that we thought initially we were going to need by working closely with the utilities and we had a really good team of utilities, people on site, including working with Balfour BT, we managed to design yeah. out a significant number of those diversions, which has, has, has really been a good result. So thanks, thanks very much again, Chris. Yeah, no problem. Sure. Thanks. There's a couple of the comments. Um, uh, Robert. Richard, sorry. Can sorry, I, yes, so the first, first three months of the first phase of COVID-19, the number of incidents, accidents, whatever you want to call them, hypos, diminished. First three months. And then we had a blip in the sort of next quarter where there was an increase. And then, believe it or not, the last two months, the number of service drugs has dropped slightly. OK, so supervision, are we getting better? Maybe we're rushing. Productivity in the first phase of COVID-19 was very high. In fact, we were able to, we took the opportunity uh, to, to push some works forward in particular. So um, I think we're getting better at reporting and sharing these things and trying to learn from them. But we've got to learn from these incidents. That's the key thing. You know, it's very frustrating. The recent incident on the LTC where they, you know, struck a gas main, high pressure gas main. It's unacceptable because, you know, they knew it was there. There was a sort of breakdown in the communication and process. Mm -hmm. But as Chris said, we need to be proactive to try and move things around and change design and have better liaison with utilities providers. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, there are a couple of comments in the uh, chat room. Uh, Robert's commented on um, uh, fiber optic uh, networks and, and problems with uh, coordinating uh diversions there yeah between uh, said various projects uh, uh, on the same corridor network eh? um, there's an amazing amount of data that goes down these cables and that they won't tolerate uh, a cable being sort of diverted some more than once in a year so sort of if if we could go in and sort of with all the projects down that corridor and coordinate with these utility companies rather than <laughs> approaching them on three separate occasions that'd be a real bonus so that uh, I, I saw that comment on the chat and i heard about that that is actually with a fairly two-bit telecoms company that just basically has one cable running across the country and unfortunately we've got mm. three projects in a line <laughs> that affect it mm. and actually before i joined uh, one of our directors went and knocked on their door and said hi we understand you won't let us do all three schemes um consecutively so can we sort of shuffle our pack and do them all uh, at the same time uh and that was that agreement was reached which is great um that's absolutely you know a great uh, success um totally understand the telecoms company's sensitivity on their data and they you know they've got key performance uh requirements that they can only have an outage every so often and have to give months and months of notice because of the sensitivity of it, completely understand that. So really this is, um, that was a sort of exception that kind of needs to then prove the rule that we need to be having more of these joined up conversations. Uh, it's again, it's the same with the gas that I mentioned earlier. They can't accept, because their networks are quite constrained, they're not like the electricity networks, some of the gas networks, particularly the high pressure gas networks, they've got very little ability when they shut a high pressure gas main down, it's quite difficult to divert that flow elsewhere. Um, and so they are much more constrained. So it, if we can put our program in front of them, they can come back and give us that data and we can then shuffle our pack accordingly, potentially. Um, 
that that's going to produce a number of challenges. So we, we need that program view first to give to them. Uh, and now it's it's then it will start to be a question of slightly holding their feet to the fire because we're not just here for a cozy chat and here's our program. What do you think of it? We actually need them to come back with some intelligence and say, yep, we're going to meet those dates. We're going to we're going to if you give us X, Y and Z, the data we need, we will hit those programs for you. And that's what this conversation is really about. It's about trying to get more program certainty from our utility friends when we have to move their assets. We don't want to move them, but if we do, we, we need to have better certainty um, for everybody's sake, uh, you know, and all the cost savings that will come with that. So um, qu trying to quantify that is quite difficult as well. Uh, so that's another little challenge there, but um, we could talk about this for ages. So uh, thanks. Thank you, Chris. I'm just with um, conscious of time, but others, there's one or two other comments around RTB9 and DPR surveys um, and any lessons learned. So if we could have feedback uh, post meeting, that would be great. Um, Abby's uh, comment around um, poor practice around initial installation. Um, so yeah, that's a, a key issue. Any learning from the LTC? I'll, we'll see if PAV can provide some feedback on, on that um, post meeting, if that's possible. Um, although Rich has already commented. Um, they've, they've completed yeah. the investigation. The, the, the quality of the investigation is uh, being reviewed. Um, but yes, there, there are quite a few issues from a design viewpoint. They've had to move 60 trial holes from the original design because they clashed with uh, known utilities. OK, thank you, Richard. Uh, Mark, you still got your hand up. I guess you, you need to put that back down. But, um, yeah, sorry, Doug. Yeah. I'll, uh, OK. Um, uh, Apologise in rushing, but um, we've got a, two or three more items to cover in this section. So um, so thank you, Chris. That was uh, very interesting. And I'm, I'm sure we can provide you further feedback on the comments you've uh, I'll comments on the chat room. Um, so the next section was around uh, incursions IPVs and Dave. Avery, I will just share screen if Dave, if you'd like to give us a quick update on that. If yeah, I can, thank you. If I can find that, hopefully that has that come through. Morning, all the information from the following slides have come from uh, Nick Nandra from Highways England um, in an email, and I've just converted them into some slides. So basically, the incursions update as of October 2020. The report is produced from AirsWeb, exported on working day two. Total number of incursions recorded since 2017, that's when the record started, is 6,491. The total number of incursions recorded in October is 176. Total number of incursions recorded with coordinates in October, October 2020 is 174. That is 99% of um, incursions record, recorded uh, came with the coordinates added. Next slide, please, Doug. Top three, a uh, summary of top three incursions recorded in October 2020. Overall, in October 2020, incursions to seek benefit was ranked first with 62, followed by driver confusion as second and 30, uh, with 37 instances. And third was breach of rolling roadblocks with 19 instances recorded, excluding breakdown type incursions within roadworks, which was also 45. Within major projects and excluded incursions as a result of breakdown, which were 36, there were 14 instances to seek benefit. Uh, nine of driver confused and one instance of each to seek information and results of an accident. There was also one instance of an IPV strike. We'll come on to the IPV strike later. Within operations directorate and excluding incursions as a result of breakdown, which there were eight, seeking benefit was the greatest with it, with 29 incursions, 
followed by driver confusion at 18 incursions and four instances as a result of an accident. Traffic officers recorded 18 incidents of rolling roadblocks being breached, with 16 incidents of seeking benefit type incursions and nine of driver confused incursions. Next slide, please, Doug. Overall, the highest number of incursions in October 2020 were recorded uh, on the following projects areas. MP 0147 M1 Junction 13 to 16 recorded a total of 30 incursions, 28. Sorry, Dave. It's, uh, I don't know if you can see, can you still see that? No, you need to go uh, forward mm. three slides. No, nope, apologies, it's jumped, doesn't it? Sorry. Yeah, that's the one. Sorry. Um, where was I? Uh, 28 instances due to breakdown type incursion, and others being one uh, to seek benefit and one IPV strike. Oh, sorry, Dave. Sorry, I'm trying to. <laughs> Sorry, this is, apologies. I'm trying to pre-prepare the following presentation, and it's uh, it's not working. Uh, sorry, Dave. There you go. Sorry, you're back. Yep. Area nine has a whole recorded of 22 incursions, with 10 instances seeking benefit, eight instances of driver confused, um, and three because of breakdown, and one as a result of an accident. Area 7 as a whole recorded a total of 12 incursions with six to seek benefit, three due to driver confused and two because of breakdown and one as a result of an accident. Area 10 as a whole recorded a total of 12, 11 incursions with six to seek benefit, three due to driver confused and one because of breakdown and one as a result of an accident. MP 0207 A19 Norton to Winyard rec recorded a total of 10 incursions with seven due to driver confusion, the other big one to seek benefit and one uh, to break down and one as a result of an accident. Next slide, please, Doug. As I said earlier, there was an IPV strike, uh, Z147 M1 Junction 13 to 16 Carriageway A, and it was Custain. On Tuesday, 20th of October 2020, at approximately 21:35 hours, uh, while TM crew were installing a taper for the lane uh, one to two closure, uh, a third party HGV uh, clipped and damaged the offside wing mirror of the Chevron IIPV. This also caused damage to the near side mirror of the third party vehicle. The third party vehicle stopped, the details were exchanged, the IPV was then taken back to the Chevron depot and replaced. There were no injuries. Next slide, please, Doug. As you can see there, there's two heat maps. This is what's produced uh, from Airsweb with all the with all the um, coordinates taken. On the left hand side, there is the uh, heat map for all the incursions which have happened in October. And then on the right hand side, um, all the incursions that have happened since the record started in 2017. Any questions? Uh, well, I'll just uh, tee up the next um, presentation. You've got a question from Robert Legg, Dave. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sort of uh, the high high percentage of breakdown uh, incursions on the M1. It's sort of, that that project stands out sort of in the data. It's having a high number of breakdowns relative to the other instances. I, I don't know if there's something that happened on that project that sort of just meant better reporting or. Oh, what? Hey, and you can prove anything with statistics, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Everything is all taken uh, via Airs Web, and you know what is reported. Um, all projects have a duty to report um, all incursions. So I guess it's just how 
how they've um, been reported. This is the data that's come from um, Nick Nandra um, via Ayers Web. Okay, thanks, Dave. Um, hopefully, just so I've got a question. Out. Sorry, go on, Martin. Sorry, I'm. Um, you carry on, my line. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm keen to know what analysis has been done on that data, uh, as in uh, what type of vehicles involved, um, what is particular about that location, where the hotspots are, uh, what you're actually learning from it, because all you're doing at the moment is just gathering data. It doesn't, it doesn't it's not telling you anything at the moment. Martin, I'll pass your question up to Nick Nandra, who's working um, in the Incursions Working Group. All I've been, all that's happened is I've been sent the data. So I'll pass that up to Nick and I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, that, that is, sorry, it's Richard. That is analysed at, at a project level and, and also uh, from an overarching viewpoint. Interestingly, we, we've found, um, not on the motorways, but on, on A roads, um, an increase in cyclists going through and becoming incursions through roadworks. Yeah, that must be. Okay, thank you, Richard. Um, can you now see the passport um, slide? <laughs> He said, hopefully. Yeah, 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 we can see that, Doug. OK, do you want to yeah. quickly go through that then, Dave? Yeah, OK. Uh, this was the slide um, presented by Malcolm Dare at the um, Highways UK event last week. And basically, um, there's been 22,675 workers on the system across 672 companies and the companies are adding um, virtually on a daily basis once the contracts have been signed and you know as the companies um, add then the workers are added onto the system as well so it's it's growing um, daily the um, the, the passport system and card holds competencies of all the workers, easy to check worker details on the site using the dedicated app, which has been um, uh, provided by Reference Point and Mighty. Card holders are able to view and maintain their details. And the cost of the passport card is £22 plus VAT annually. The Highways Common Induction is now online. And it's not eight hours anymore. It's uh, an hour to an hour and a half that can be done online. Uh, part one is the HE key messages for road workers and road users, including safer driving when working or using our network. Part two is the common risks of HE sites. We continue to work on the new online highways common induction and expect it to be ready very soon. Um, we believe it's going to be ready by the 16th of November. Um, there was an issue uh, when you go to log in and it asked you to validate your email. Some of the uh, security on various companies were rejecting it and they couldn't log on. The cost of the Highways Common Induction is now £14 per person and you undertake this every three years. The benefits of the scheme is to remove duplication, to ability to move from site to site, provides a common standard and creates a network of advocates. Um, and as you can see, if you want to uh, sign up to the system, um, the webs uh, the uh, website address is there for Mighty. And um, for more information, if you log on to the Highway Safety Hub um, and under the tile Passport, it's got lots of information, all the latest updates, and frequently asked questions. And just to plug the Highway Safety Hub, uh, they also have their own Twitter feed, which um, you can log on via Twitter. And anything that happens on the safety hub, like safety alerts, you will be um, notified of what's been added. So you haven't got to log on every day. 
it comes up to you and you can read it on your mobile phone. So just a plug there for Highway Safety Hub and Twitter. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Dave. I'm, I'm just conscious on time. Um, this will so be quick. It, it'll be good. <laughs> so yes, if you could be very quick. Uh, Tim, is, is that up on screen now? It is. Great, thanks. Good. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, I won't go through this page by page by page because um, <clears throat> since the last time we undertook this review, we've had, <clears throat> excuse me, 33 um, safety alerts issued by HE, of which there is a list of them there. Oh, Sorry. shot forward, Doug. Sorry. There's a list of them there and the dates. Interestingly, Richard, from what you said earlier about a lull in strikes, there doesn't seem to have been a lull in the then again, there's not too many, I suppose, in a six month period, but there seems to be consistent through every month. There's been a safety alert through COVID periods. Um, I say there's a link at the bottom for people that don't know the presentation to the hub again, the Highway Safety Hub web page where these can all be found. Um, just sort of brushing over this again quickly, we as Arcadis run a review every month on the safety alerts that's managed um, by ed within our team and we categorize safety alerts from the review of our pd team and health and safety team and we put them into these categories um and the totals and percentages you sorry. keep shooting through doug sorry it's too sorry. quick too I'm quick sorry. apologies and you can probably the the uh, most significant line is percentage of total at the bottom there where you can see where we as a team have tried to categorize the the root cause issues relating to the safety alerts. Um, at the moment, the um, check sheets, basically some new information would help to uh, remove the incident. We've got um, RAMS breaches quite high. Um, inf information design change, we've currently got a 5.6%. Um, services, we've only got down at 3.6 at the moment in current safety alerts. Um, so there's not a huge amount of safety alerts coming through safety st um, stats strikes at present. Okay, I guess we're going to jump through these at the moment. We are going to jump through these. So basically to, I knew we'd end up with sort of the catch up shift. So um, the actual, <laughs> <laughs> the actual safety alert is provided by the link um, in blue there and for people that are, are not aware, we, the lessons learned we feel as Arcadis CDM safety team, um, lessons learned is all in the red text. As I say, there's 33 of these, so um, I won't be going through every sheet because there's 16 pages. But for instance, there's sort of taking off safety gloves. There's um, there, there's grab chuck access ladders where people fell off them. Um, camera winch failures. There's a few camera winch failures in the month in the period. Um, Yep, carry on through those ones. There was a fatal at the top there. Unfortunately, there was a 5G protest was around the spread of COVID and all that and people um, putting um, needles in the way to try and hurt people. Lost time, camera winch again, failure on that one. Um, there's one here which we've kept on. I've got a little bit of information at the top. Um, and we felt when we reviewed this one, I think we did this this week, we reviewed this one and it was a potential review at today's meeting. We've probably not got time for that, have we, Doug? Probably not, no. But it, it was an interesting one where there was a PECA involved on a bridge and they ended up going straight through the bottom of the bridge. And it was surely that type of information should have been available on pre-construction information. Um, and it was lack of information provided to the contractors. So but sorry yeah, to rush you, Tim. But <laughs> yes, but yeah, you can all have a look through that one. Um, I've myself put the and link Doug to the Highway Safety Hub uh, for the uh, safety alerts in the minutes, Tim, so everyone cool. will be able yeah. to look at those. Cool. Yeah, it's at the front as well. And all those blue links go straight through to the Safety Hub as well. Um, this was something me and Doug put together. We've got a presentation later on on Airs Web and Myself and Doug came up with these discussion points um, where we we forwarded these onto the ESWeb team. Um, 
what information is available is well we've presented these and hopefully they'll come back and answer them later but it's a memory jogger for people to also come up with questions for later on thank you and Tim. that's rattled through yes sorry apologies for that but um... you said that had 40 minutes <laughs> <laughs> um uh, moving on swiftly um jim would you mind just giving a quick update no, okay. on the constructability we, we we've can... been going on for two hours now without a break yeah well I, I, okay we we can um we can stop now uh, i know we're at the break point um and put this through to um after the break if that's okay with jim uh, yeah yep, fine by me yeah okay i know we've got jason lined up um uh, as the follow-on um so shall we say come back in 10 minutes if that's okay Everybody. Thanks for that. I'm gagging for a coffee. Yeah. It's, it's just oh, not acceptable, is it really? Yeah, this is a health and safety meeting focused. It Two is. hours is on a Skype call without a break isn't really what we do normally, is it? Very true, Paul. Very true. But, uh, okay, well, uh, we'll everybody back at uh, 25 past if that's okay. Thank you very much.
Oh, hello again, everybody. Um, trust everybody is suitably uh, refreshed. Um, apologies again to Tim for uh, rushing through the uh, safety alerts, but just picking up a comment from Robert uh, around the work that Jacob's doing a similar line uh, around uh, the design perspectives and slim pickings. Yeah, I, th I think that is a bit of an issue in sort of root cause analysis. Um, and and there's, there's obviously more uh, de design issues uh, or contribution contributory issues uh, and it's often difficult at the moment with the safety alerts and hopefully it's a, an issue we can pick up uh, when we talk with the um, AIRS web team. Um, so moving on to hopefully Jim's back um, and just very quickly um, around the temporary works uh, constructability report. Okay uh, thank you. Um, right uh, can everybody hear us okay? I am coming through yeah. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks, good stuff. So this is to report on the progress of the Temporary Works Forum and the Guide on Constructability produced by Working Group 25. Um, as a definition, the Working Group chose to use the network, network rail definition of constructability, and that is the extent to which the design of a building or construction project and its environment facilitates its ease of construction subject to the overall requirements of the building or construction project and its environment, which is all a bit of a mouthful. Um, for me, constructability is about optimum design. It's minimising the work content to safely deliver the project. Um, so Andrew's uh, video at the beginning of the block cutting was of particular interest. Um, and also, as, as sort of mentioned by in the, the safety by design, what was, is covered in the constructability guide will dovetail into the work being done there. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Constructability is the result of decisions made by all the parties involved in a construction project. So the client, the architect, the permanent works designer, the temporary works designer and the contractors. So from the, the outset, the aim of the working group uh, was for the guide to be relevant and useful to all parties. Um, the aims were set very high. Uh, a guidance document that could be used by the whole industry clients, architects, permanent works designers, temporary works designers and contractors. The guidance should cover the constructability of permanent works and the associated temporary works. Uh, and the aim would be to improve safety, reduce carbon and reduce costs. Um, the guide should also cover all aspects of construction work, uh, not just highways, bridges and railways. Uh, could, sorry, uh, if you move on to yeah, timetable. Um, so it was important to avoid getting bogged down uh, and allow the, the sort of production of the guide to be stalled. So as timetable was set out um, to produce the, the first edition within 12 months, uh, most of the dates were hit. Um, issuing the document as a draft for member comment added a couple of months. Uh, and I suppose we also had COVID in there as well. Uh, some time was spent collating and coordinating examples from contributors and getting released to be able to use the photographs. Um, and it's also acknowledged that this is just a first edition and depending on the interest it generated, uh, revisions and further editions uh, are expected. Uh, next slide, please. So the working group was selected to represent the whole industry. Uh, the members of the working group were members of the Temporary Works Forum, and I'd like to thank uh, Andrew, Tim, uh, John, Doug and Chris for their contribution. Um, the only people who we tried to contact and who declined, uh, we did try and get in touch with Temporary Works, uh, sorry, Transport for London, beg your pardon, um, but they were unable to attend. And we did try and get architects to attend and um, we drew a blank with them. Uh, if it hadn't been for COVID, we would have done more work on trying to get in touch with architects. Uh, by the time the members of the working group took part in the February 2019 workshop, a draft document had already been produced and the working group basically had an, ed an editorial function and um, to contribute examples. If you move on to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so the guide was published in October 2020. Uh, and the aspects covered are definitions of constructability, a reminder of the legal requirements to consider constructability, uh, the construction process, uh, procurement models used in the UK, uh, constructability principles, when to consider constructability, a methodolog methodological approach to, to carrying out constructability reviews, uh, references and bibliography, 
uh, appendices and some examples of good and bad practice. Uh, if just go to the next slide then. Um, I'd like to highlight a, a couple of parts. Um, as I said, we've included the network real defini definition of constructability. It's uh, difficult to put these things succinctly and this definition was chosen. It's also fair to say that Network Rail are very keen on constructability and integrating into their projects. Um, as Nick was saying, they've already produced a document called Safe by Design. Um, there are also reminders in the document of the statutory requirements and good practice to consider constructability. Um, and although the sections quoted on the slide relate to designers, there are also duties on the clients as well. Um, so a couple of things there, CDM 2015, obviously BS 5975 and Syria C755. Um, if you're a designer or a client or a principal designer or a permanent works designer or a temporary works designer or have anything to do with temporary works design, 5975 is the document to read. If you move on to next slide, um, it briefly mentions lean construction uh, low carbon construction and uh, UK procurement models, but mostly the guide focuses on off-site construction and holding constructability reviews. Uh, the off-site construction only works if you can get a, a crane big enough, um, and that means temporary foundations for the crane and suitable access route for the crane and for the kit. And in some instances, I've actually reversed the decision to um, precast and build off site and actually built in situ because of the difficulties of getting plant to the site. In terms of constructability reviews, it talks about interactive workshops, uh, who should attend, when you should hold them and what you should consider during the uh, constructability review. If you go on to the next slide, please. So, I mean, all the procurement models used in the UK follow the same sort of pattern. We've got the, the Highways England project control framework, we've got Network Rails Grip, we've got REBA, we've got uh, Construction Industry Council, and we've got the, the recently published uh, ISTRUC T plan of work. Um, but they all follow the same pattern. They're all called different things, but you've always got a, a pre-project initiation, an options phase, a development phase, construction phase, a use, and then an, an end of use, a demolition. If you go on to the next slide, please. So what we've identified is that if you overlaid that you're probably familiar with this kind of a graph which says that project cost uh, or the cost of design change increases with the stage progress of the project so the message is simple you've got to consider constructability as early as possible to avoid the high costs of change and redesign later in the project um, it also identified uh, where stages when constructability, constructability could be considered formally and at each of these stages the input of in, information and the outcome are different. So we've got those four stages, project initiation, option development and selection, detailed design, pre-construction cost estimate, tender stage and pre-construction stage, so the actual site work stage. If you go on, next slide please. Um, the, the document is in two parts. There is the, the guidance document and then there is also a Word document you can download at the same time. And the, the guide uh, talks about each of these stages uh, in text form, so paragraphs and bullet points and things like that. But the Word document you can download takes this and puts it into a, a spreadsheet format, um, or a template format, so you can actually carry out the, 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 the work practically. Um, so that's the first part of the, the template. And if you move on down to the next stage, that's just an example of, of what part of the template looks like. Um, so you've got, it's made up of a number of headings. So action, who, what, when and where, uh, impact, scope, program and cost, and then a box for signing off. Um, if you go on to the next slide, please. There's also examples within the, the guidance of good and poor practice. Um, again, they're not all related to bridges. So, uh, for example, one of the, the examples there is Dover Western Docks Revival, where Tony G managed to modularize um, a, 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 a pier um, so that it could be built very, very slickly. We, re we reduced the number of components that had to be lifted and transported and the amount of temporary works that were needed. In fact, we virtually eliminated temporary works. 
uh, with being able to construct it. There's also an example of BIM from Network Rail. Um, that's part of Manchester Victoria Station and the, the constructability that we're able to see by virtual models. But it also points out um, examples of poor practice. That is a, 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 an integral bridge which has a piece of cantilevering reinforcement seven meters long, which weighs almost 100 kilograms. Um, you know, the person who designed that didn't think about how it was going to be built. So if you go into the next slide, please. Uh, I mean, how to get a copy. Um, the, the Temporary Works Forum uh, has a membership of around about 200 contractors, designers, suppliers and specialists. Uh, but all the Temporary Works Forum documents are free to download. Unfortunately, I haven't done anything smart with the link, so you'll just need to click on that very long set of hieroglyphics there. Um, so as I say, it, it's freely available to everybody. So please click on the link, uh, download it, use it, comment on it. Um, and if you want to get involved in uh, helping with the next edition, if your company's not already a member of the Temporary Works Forum, then by all, my, all means, please join us um, and get involved in producing the next edition. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, are there any uh, questions, comments for Jim while I'm setting up the next presentation? Would Jim mind putting that link into the comments so I can put it into the minutes, please? I know you've got a copy of the presentation, but I don't know if Jim might be able to just share that link in the comments so I can place it into the minutes, if that'd be okay, Jim. Uh, in the comments of the chat? Oh. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, in the chat uh, box. Thank you. If you're able to, that'd be lovely. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, while we're setting up, um, I hope Jason's on the call. And apologies that we're running a few minutes late. Um, um, we did have a, a, a note of sort of eliminating a risk from the outset uh, with Mike. Uh, Mike Boyland, uh, Mike, is it possible just to give us a quick update? I'm, I'm, my understanding is nothing has moved on as yet. Is, would that be the case? No, and um, if you're, if you're quite right, Doug and Tori will jump in here as well if you need to say anything. And we, we've not heard back from um, Mike Wilson, our end, on, on the paper that we submitted in June. Um, I don't know whether Doug Richard, you wanted to sort of um, to take over that role and formally endorse the paper that Tori has submitted as part of the task and finish group um, and, and note the contents or whether we still um, persist on, on trying to get some feedback from, from the CHG. It's, it's difficult. It, we're, we, we can talk out, out offline, but it, we're in the budget season, aren't we? So um, is it budgeted for next year? Um, in terms of a sort of a, a, a SPATS task, it will be, yeah. Okay, well, that's something positive. Um, maybe we can talk offline because I'm conscious of time, Mike. We do need to progress this. Sorry, somebody wants to speak. Yeah, Doug, sorry, Richard. Thank you, this is Toria. Um, it would be great for the task group to put a lot of um, effort and um, all their, their great ideas into the recommendations that we know this gets taken forward or at least it's been reviewed and prioritised. Um, I think it just feels like it's just sort of disappeared and it'd be nice to know that there are the next steps. I know this current small spats task, we're picking up one or two things and trying to de develop them a bit further and there's obviously a plan for next year, which is good to hear. But it'd be nice for this group, I think, to say, is there more that the principal designers working group can be involved with or is it now being passed on and being managed through different um, uh, teams within High Rise England. Uh, it just feels like it hasn't been closed out a bit, I think, and it'd be nice to know that, that, that these recommendations have been taken forward or at least reviewed. Do you have a comment on that, Mike? No, Tori put it much better than uh, than I did. I think, I, you know, I'm mindful that I'm sort of, I'm wearing two hats here. I was part of that task and finish group. Um, yep. I'm also sort of part of, the, part of the client team as well internally. So, um, yeah, I absolutely agree with that. It would be this would have some acknowledgement from this group at least. And even if then, Richard, we we sort of, sort of chase it offline with Mike and um, and his private office. 
yeah. You know, okay. I, I fully support what you've been doing and um, we need to drive it forward. Um, it's just frustrating that no decision has been made. Is it something that needs to be added into the remit of the supply chain safety leadership group? Because um, it kind of happened separately through this working group. And I wonder if yeah. because it doesn't have that high level. I don't know. <laughs> is it, or is it something that's now complete and now we move forward and focus on the other task groups? No, that's a good point, actually, Terea. I'll speak to Mark Byard on that. I'm just writing it on his personal post-it note of actions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for the feedback on that. And uh, yeah, hopefully it will move on. Um, and yes, the, the group did a lot of good work there. I think uh, you, you're right, Toria. Um, Jason, hopefully Hello. you are uh, online. And I'm, I am, it, I'm here, yeah, listening. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, would you mind introducing yourself? And I trust everybody can see the, um, the first page of the presentation, which I will. Yeah, of course. Okay. okay. So thank you very thank much. Uh, my name is Jason Glass, and I'm head of asset management development within SES Directorate Homes England, and I am responsible for, amongst a, a number of things, uh, leading on the company's asset management transformation program. Um, I probably here under false pretenses in terms of what I'm going to cover today. I think you might have been expecting me to talk in detail about pre-construction information, health and safety files, ability to use BIM data and asbestos data. Unfortunately, I'm not the appropriate person to speak about that, but I am the appropriate person to speak about the asset management transformation program. Some of the, it's not totally irrelevant. Some of those things are covered in, in, a, in a general sense in terms of some of the improvements that we'll be looking at as part of the transformation program, but I'll, I'll, I'll describe those. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll go through the slides as quickly as possible, because I think some of the value may be in, in some of the discussion around that, as opposed to me just talking at you for, for 20 minutes or, or however long I've got for this slot. So if you could go to the next slide, please. And, and the next one. So our strategic approach to asset management, obviously we, in, in line with uh, appropriate good asset management practice, we have published an asset management policy. It is contained at the, so that's a, for the one, I assume that you will be um, circulating these notes. I wouldn't click on it now, because I, usually I struggle to get back to the presentation, but if you click on the asset management policy, once you have the slides, that'll take you to the, um, both the policy and the strategy that's been published on the .gov website. Um, the policy sets out our strategic intent to asset management across the company and explained in more detail then within the strategy. We then have a plan to bring us to the to the descriptions that we describe within it. I just wanted to highlight really six key principles that our policy and our strategy does talk about. So if you go on to the next slide, whoever's driving that, please. So these are the, the, the six key elements that come out as a theme throughout our policy and then into our strategy and then into the sort of the, the detailed suite of documents that sits beneath those. They shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone, but they are in our in as, as a statement within our policy and strategy, they become a level of commitment that the company has assigned to these. Our transformation program then will help us realize these. So this isn't necessarily what we would see as either behaviors or performance or outcomes across the company, but it's certainly our stated intent to get to this point. So obviously we design build, so focusing on customer service, we design build and maintain, operate our assets to deliver a level of service to our customers. So the, the, the principle behind that is that we don't, you know, that the end point for an asset isn't actually that the asset is there, it's safe, whatever, it's there only to provide that level of service to the customer. And that, that sometimes sounds as though an obvious statement, but it, it doesn't always drive the behaviours that we see. And, and sometimes, depending on what part of the organisation we're from, we see the end point as some way sort of before the level of service actually is satisfied to the customer. Uh, linking strategic planning to service delivery. So this is trying to bring together the various parts of the company. So obviously we have colleagues in our strategy and planning um, directorate that deal with that setting the long-term vision of the network, what do we need and what the SRN to become, 
and then what's our iterative steps towards achieving that but how do we see that translating into practical steps from this point onwards up until sort of the 2050 vision and beyond again that historically that there's there has been some disconnects between the two none of them are wrong and all of our activities are the right thing to do for our own individual aims and objectives but do they stem from a single strategic vision and then that flows through all of the work that we do and we talk about right intervention at the right time and obviously that's about having the right tools and information to understand our set needs now and into the future so re relatively straightforward ask in that sense and using our asset knowledge to manage risk so this is talking about how do we actually use asset knowledge asset condition asset performance and balance that against risk to start making some not necessarily different but but more informed and wider decisions around investment in the asset going forward making better whole life decisions so this one should be relevant to the to the people on this call around where we say that building an asset is just the start but actually there's an increasing level of focus around how we design that not not so much in terms of some of the discussion you've just had around sort of the 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 temporary works but in terms of designing an asset to suit customer needs does that mean that we we look at things slightly differently now and it isn't just around some of the constraints that we've historically uh, worked around and then empowering and connecting our people so our although we talk about the strategic road asset actually as far as our company is concerned it, it is it is our people mm -hmm. not, and not just he people but our people and our supply chains that actually delivers all of these aspects and we're nothing without the, the, the skills, the capabilities of that critical asset, i.e. our people asset, to make it happen. OK, if you'd like to go on to the next slide. By the way, if you and, and the next one, sorry, if, if you've got any questions, I don't, I don't know the sort of the, 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 the way that you deal with presentations. I'm more than happy just to people to shout out. I'm not sure if I'll see hands or not, but if you <coughs> however your usual way of raising comments, if you just want to raise any questions going forward, I'm happy to take them as we go forward rather than end. So okay, yes, well, we, we, we have sorry. the sort of hands up system and, and the chat box as well. So yeah, but, uh, I'll, I'll feed those through as. Um, OK, great. If you if you see any, Doug, then if you see any hands up, then just shout them out. And then, yeah. then yeah, that's fine. OK, um, so this is our operating model for our asset management approach. This was agreed with our senior leadership. So we have an asset management steering group that's uh, chaired by Mike Wilson with uh, Vicky Higgin and um, as exec directors in fact there is uh, Elliot, Vicky, Mike and Peter Mumford that attend the asset management steering group so it is a formal subgroup of the exec. They've agreed this basic operating model just to try and set out some of the constituent elements of our end-to-end -end asset management approach. It isn't meant to be anything that, that, that defines it in detail, it's just to give us a, a staging post for the various stages so we, we start off left and go through our strategy and that's around a long term vision around establishing levels of service and I won't go through all of the individual um, stages right through to our, how we plan our asset interventions both in a technical sense and obviously it's about that translation of the vision into actual interventions actual projects on the ground and then through into delivery of the various aspects of the asset life cycle phase whether that's asset creation operation maintenance and eventually renewal or disposal. And then the review cycle take, takes that around again. If you'd like to go on to the next slide. Again, you won't be able to read this, and so I've sort of apologies there, but obviously if you've got the slides, you'll be able to see these in more details. This is our this this is the detail of our transformation program. So working with that senior leadership group and then a, a number of sessions across the company, we've identified some of the blockers or challenges or or indeed opportunities around improving our asset management approach and within this sort of fairly typical um, sunshine diagram then just highlighting some of those key elements that we'll be focusing on and that we're focusing on now and then moving across the, the remainder of this road period um, to address so if you keep going Doug and then and again so what I was going to do is then just talk about some of the areas that I think would be of interest to the people on the group and if you go through I wasn't going to talk a lot about strategy because I obviously given the, the function of this group I've assumed that there isn't a no, Jason we, we lost you
Seems to have fallen off, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. Um, Just as Pav was starting to ask questions. <laughs> that was fatal. <laughs> Sorry, Pav. Um, mm, right. Yes. I'll hopefully, we'll rejoin. But uh, let me just see. Doesn't say he's dropped off on the. Hmm. Hmm. Yes, that was my technical right, so glitch, I'm know. afraid. Yeah, I lost my internet connection then, I think. Ah, sorry, right. Yeah, OK. <laughs> I think, Jason, in the fear of you losing your internet connection again, maybe if Doug could share with you some of the questions that have come through on the chat. OK, sure. Um, yeah, can do. Um, can you see those, Jason, or shall I read them out? Uh, let me just put the conversation up. Um, Where, where do the questions start from? OK, uh, all right, yeah, I can see them. Contact you and your team who are specialists for CDM requirements. The CDM requirements in terms of um, health and safety file, that's with our health and safety group. So that's, I think, more in uh, Mike Boyland. I think you're on the call. I think that would be more within your group. We will deal with some of the data elements of that. So we talk about data exchange shortly, but the, the actual health and safety file defining the elements within that and what should or shouldn't be form part of the health and safety file I know has been dealt with by the health and safety group. Um, can't see where the requirement to make asset information available to others working on the network fits into those elements. So I mean, we talk about data collection, so there are some themes that run right through all of these, and some of them then, because they don't appear in any one one place, they run right through. So when we talk about data collection, that is around that that data exchange. So that those are some. There are a number of different versions of this. There are because obviously data exchange works really right from the first block right up until the end one and back through again. So there's no single point where that's particularly apparent. So there, that that works within that one, but there are a number of improvements across the place and um, oh, it's a long question there um how do we request that asset data can be changed to match the demands from the different stages of the product for example how is or H drainage management system being able to provide sufficient information for future design that is probably part of the we have an asset data management manual that, that is owned that, that I own that within within my group that sets the, the the way that we describe assets in a data sense so what sort of the, the, the hierarchy classification the data attribution that's set within the ADMM so hopefully a document that that you're um, have full visibility of is there a, any there is a, a a working group for ADMM and then any changes to the way that we describe the asset then are highlighted and then go through successive improvements of the ADMM, which I know can cause a problem in itself. And it's something we're looking at to try and reduce the number of updates that we see to ADMM, because that some feedback we have is there's far too many updates and the business struggles to absorb the impact and particularly the risks and costs that those continuous changes generate. Um, I think Pav had his, his hand up then, or has he put it back down again? Just to give you uh, clarification of where I'm coming from, um, the ADMM states that uh, the area teams only do a very basic asset review of the drainage. So I just wanted to give you that one in context. But doing a project like Lower Thames Crossing, we need invert levels, we need condition surveys, we need CCTV. And so what we've got is a difference between what the asset, asset team is actually asking for in terms of contractually to the op operations directorate and what we need as designers and what we need as demolition people and for future maintenance. So there's a, a bit of gap in pre-construction information from what the ADMM is producing. Uh, and ADMM is, is the only tool that they'll only deliver what's in the ADMM contractually because that's all they're paid to do. But we need a, a volume of additional information, invert levels, where does the water flow, where does the 
contaminated water flow and these sort of things, that's not shown. Yeah, and and I I I mean it, it, as in all these things, it, the devil's in the detail. But in in the sense of the ADMM describes the routine requirements for for our asset data, as and when an individual project has needs over and above that sort of baseline level that we agree with oper op operations, then obviously that will be subject to the individual data gathering exercises as part of that that project. I think the challenge that we have is that, that we collect that data in a consistent way so that once it's collected on an individual project basis, we can then populate our asset information systems then because that data then has been described and surveyed in a consistent manner, we can then utilize that data going forward. But I don't think it would be possible to provide all data for all uses at the outset on a routine basis, purely on a cost basis. So the, the other problem that we've got is, for example, the stats coordination. We are gathering the information once, then a new contractor comes along. We are gathering the information again and again and again. So there's multiple costs of that scenario rather than having a single database ran that's undertaken by Highways England. Put in three sets of stats coordinations um, for a typical project as, as we get new contractors. There's not a consistency and that will actually give you efficiency to actually say, look, we need this information and the single source of truth is Highways England's database rather than having to reinvestigate it on a project level. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a, it is a very valid point. And, and, and I, but I, I know in terms of um, statutory undertakers equipment, there is a process, I don't know if you've come across it being led by DFT to coordinate um, the identification and recording of um, stats equipment on one single database and so it's not HE specific, it's not local authority specific, it's not even supplier specific but bringing all of that together because obviously we face that challenge on our own schemes as do other authorities, as do other providers. So I think that they are looking to bring that into one single place that there's a trial underway at the moment and I think that Highways England will be contributing to that but rather use that as opposed to building our own separate database then comprising um, uh, stats equipment. Uh, I know there's one or two more further questions coming through. Um, I'm just sort of conscious of time, and maybe we could uh, take these questions back to you uh, post the uh, uh, post the event. Uh, but one question Rogers asked uh, is around: Can the, the view of whole life cost be expanded further? Often a disconnect between MP promoted projects and the longer term OD. Um, operation and maintenance um, aspects. Yeah, and, and that, that whoever asked that question it is a really, it's a sort of a very insightful question. There is a lot of work underway to try and understand what what do we mean by that? What and what behaviours are we seeing across the company? Because as, as we know, quite often that the, the objectives and the deadlines and the things that we are held to account for aren't necessarily the things that we would talk about in a high level policy or strategy in terms of how we approach our assets. So whilst we will make the statement around in our policy and strategy around the, the sort of the, the design and creation of the asset is just the beginning. And actually we, we look to design assets for the, the use across the whole of their serviceable life. How does that translate into reality on an individual project when Sort of people are being held to account for the cost of design and the speed of design, speed of construction, safety of construction, all of those competing elements. How do we introduce that that whole life operation part of the asset in reality? So I think that it's those are that is one of the elements of the the transformation plan in trying to understand that there are um, streams to, to try and improve the relationship between operations, between major projects, between SES in that sense, but also how do we translate that in terms of a driver for behavior and what we're seeing by way of designs that that actually may have cost more they may take longer to to construct what have you because they they re we're recognizing that actually something that's designed for reduced or zero maintenance in the future less disruption to customer all of those elements we're seeing that translate into things that may not be immediately um, acceptable to project sponsors, whatever you're on individual projects at the moment, given the the uh, objectives or absolute constraints that people are being held to. And, and these are all embedded in the five-year plan? Is it, is, yeah. is it a five-year so, plan? Yeah, so I, I don't know if it's worth just 
clicking on to the next uh, couples, but I was going to draw out the sort of some of the areas in there. And if you go on to the next one, again, obviously you'll be able to, to flick through these, and I'm, I'm more than happy to take sort of subsequent questions for things I'm aware. It's a lot of information to go through in a very short period of time. But so we we talk here around sort of the the uh, governance. So a lot of this is around the information. So a lot of those first numbers you can see are related to our information strategy. So that's about data and information. But they are a lot of these are around how do we then ultimately get better design, better construction of of assets in the, in their longer terms. So we we look at asset class strategies. There, this is around actually what do we mean by that that better design? We've got the I don't know if you've come across it yet. I think it's a a a new product that's being developed that started life in in within uh, major projects number twelve around the asset renewals matrix. Again, agreeing the the scope of renewals as part of major projects as part of operations portfolios, and it as part of that we we're also looking at the role of the um, asset steward. So the operational regional director who ultimately has responsibility for the asset uh, with all assets within their region. How do the them as the ultimate owner, but also effectively the maintainer and operator of that asset, have a meaningful input to the design, particularly of assets that they will ultimately inherit then to ensure the, the sort of building on the last question around the the facets of that design that will affect its safe and efficient maintenance and operation. Um, if you um, go on again, so I think probably the next one was just highlighting that the ones that would be of interest. So we've got the um, asset data strategy and asset information strategy. So we struggle and no doubt that you probably had long discussions yourself around where does data reside? What's the overall plan for our systems? We have a number of individual systems. Those systems don't talk to each other and we have a we obviously have significant problems both from a, a managing the network aspect but also then pulling the data in so part of the um, BIF project that that obviously no doubt you you'll be using is is as a result of some of those difficulties that we've had but that that was a solution to provide an immediate response and and to overcome the problems that we've had in a, in a legacy sense around our systems what we need to do going forward is to understand well what is it that we need our systems to do how do they look and not just keep replicating the sort of the, the position where whereby a lot of these systems sort of emanated from, but to step back, take a view as to what we need them to be, who owns them, who funds them, how are they operated, what are those roles and responsibilities around the the, the ownership and use of those individual systems, and then how does that um, shape down into also then our related but different asset data strategy, and again, what does that look like by way of of roles and accountabilities across the different parts of the organization. I think there is a governance model that, that we are working with ITD to produce and then ultimately an asset data improvement plan. So a lot of that is actually understanding in a in a company sense, what is it that that, that asset data that we need to drive our investment decisions? And I don't mean then just in terms of long term strategic decisions, but ultimately down to individual scheme design what is that asset data that, that really drives the company? Do we collect that asset data in the right way, in a consistent way? Do we look after, do we manage that asset data so that when people go to, to actually draw that data down, they can trust it and they don't have to start spending a long period of time questioning the validity, the accuracy, the, the scope and coverage of that data. Actually, because of the way that we describe that, the way that we actually assign a effectively a quality element to that data, it won't necessarily say that the data is wrong, but the user will understand what what is the fit for purpose use of that individual data set. Could, could I ask what, what the aspiration is in terms of asset information models, um, long term or short term and long term? Um, is, is there an aspiration to integrate all the, the data into to, to the models that the, the projects are developing? I mean, um, in terms of RDP, etc., because uh, there's a lot of work going on at the moment uh, across the network, um, and, and in terms of projects that are being delivered uh, and the contracts are required to produce, having produced a project information model, then produce a, an asset information model uh, to hand back to, to to OD, and and at the moment OD can't 
uh, can't use those models, so they just sit on, you know, sit on the, um, sit in the, in, you know, on the, um, on the fence, sort of gathering dust, as yeah. it were. Yeah, they, 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 I, unfortunately, I can't give you an answer now. But we we recognise that that is a serious problem. It's come up. You know, to say it's come up a number of times would be a bit of an understatement. It does come up frequently. There is a a piece of work that's but it's, it's actually in this plan. It's also in the information vision and strategy, and it talks about so it's headed around data exchange. So that's not just the hand back of information from a major project back to operations, but right from the the, the first phase of work, the data exchange that go, effectively goes backwards or forwards, primarily from a major project to an operation sense. How do we actually describe that in a way that not just says what is what is the data that we need what does it look like but how is that done so we're aware that effect you know we, we've come from i've heard horror stories of carrier bags of hard disks and what have you been handed over and, and find their way into a cupboard if they're lucky and you know that that's not where we're, obviously we need to be that data exchange piece is is now and will be looking at how do we manage that how do we ask for and describe the data and the format and the sense that we actually want to receive that data in. So there's obviously a, a data that's produced to actually design and construct the scheme. There is also then the data that we want to see handed over at, at the sort of the back end of the project. They don't necessarily have to be the same thing, but we can describe the data that we want to see at the end of it and describe that in a way that's consistent across all projects. It is then for the individual projects to decide how and when they produce that data to, to be handed over. But at least then with the, with the end point in mind that from from day one, that the, the, the data model information model within that individual project can be developed on the basis of a known position as to what will be required to be handed back and how that's required to be handed back at the end of the project. And I think that's probably on the, the, the next slide. I think that was probably in the, in the, the last stages on I'm trying to guess the end of the, the the slide deck now. If you just click again, so this was just reminding people of the overall model and then sort of the, the back end. Yeah, so, so I think that's number 17 around where we talk about data handover. That's talking about the, the data exchange project. So we do we do recognise and and you know we 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 can't answer all the questions now. I think the the only glimmer of hope in that sense is that we recognise the, the problem to the extent of that there is a major piece of work to improve that. And then it's now working with um, ITD, particularly Ian Gordon, who's developing the, the data models of, and ontology across the company. And then as part of their um, data as a service and their information management system approach, then how we then describe that at, at an individual asset class level, then it is sort of our working in partnership with ITD in that sense. That. The, the sort of I think the, the only last slide then was just talking about those those elements on the, the, the final parts of the slide. Yes, yeah, so that okay. number 17 was what I talked about in a data uh, improved data exchange. Jason, it's Richard Wilson from uh, HE. How can this group, principal designers, uh, designers help you with your job? How can we input to help you? Well, I, I, I think First of all, it, it was it was good to receive the invite, Richard, and and sort of getting that that foot sort of segue into this group. I I think we are always looking for um, willing participants to support in the various elements. So so this is not a a program of activity, and I should have said this at the outset. And forgive me. This isn't a program of activity that we are designing in one place within SES to roll out then across the company. This describes a lot of those activities that are either underway or will be sort of triggered in this road period and that that they can be delivered by any part of the company. So a number of the elements I've already talked about aren't even being delivered by SES. They're either being delivered by operations or major projects or ITD. I think to have a, a group of um, knowledgeable experts that need to ultimately shape some of the delivery within the plan, I think is, is useful. And, and I think it's how do we utilise this group and I'm ha I'm happy and through obviously um, Amy as well and I think Amy is somewhere on, on on the list I think Amy is part of this group as well is how do we utilize the skills and, and specialisms that exist 
within this group because there is, as you can imagine, there's lots of consultation, there's lots of sort of co-development as part of the programme. And I think we can utilise either this group or representatives of this group then to help us in development of some of the articles and products that, that are that comprise the transformation plan. OK. Doug, I think we need to move on. Jason, yes. thank you very much. I'm sure you'll be uh, a guest in the future again. OK, Richard, I will do. Um, do. Do we think it's an opportunity to put a, a bit of a task and finish group together maybe to support Jason and maybe talk about that after the? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think there's yeah. a good opportunity there. And I know, I know Pav will be very pleased to contribute. I'm sure he will. Yes. OK, well, Richard, shall, I, you, shall I continue the dialogue through through you, Richard, on, on that? And then we can sort of let, sort of scope yes, that out and look, yeah, look at what yeah. that will comprise and then sort of yeah. what, what that ongoing engagement looks like, as well as answering any of those questions that have come out from this group. Yeah, it's, it's Doug and myself, and I think you've got Doug's email address. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I'm happy to be a link as well if there's anything um, that comes out of the meeting. OK, thank you, Amy. OK, okay thank and, you, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to speak to you and, and hopefully I'll be speaking to you all again on, on an ongoing basis from this point onwards. Thank you, Jason. OK, okay thank, thank you. you. I'll just jump ahead uh, to the AIRS web team and then do a bit of a catch up uh, at the end, if that's OK. Yep. So I'm trusting that Natalie and Stuart are on the call and I will just bring up. Uh, well, actually, it says it, we don't actually have a presentation, so I think it's a case of uh, sharing uh, sharing their screen. Um, uh, and once again, apologies for a, a slight uh, overrun. Do, do we have Natalie and, and uh, Stuart? Hi, Doug. Yeah, how are you? Uh, fine, thank you. A bit panicking here, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, do you want me to kick off, Doug? If you could, that would be excellent. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So good afternoon, folks, and thank you for the, the invite to come and talk today. Um, I got with me my colleagues, Natalie Jost, um, I think Adam Porter's on the call as well, um, so I'll let them introduce themselves. Afternoon, Nat. She's probably on mute. She's there somewhere, and Adam's there somewhere, I hope. So oh, I can see that. Oh, yeah. They are there. There you go. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll get on to the rest of the team a little bit later on. But just wanted to do a brief introduction to start, really, just to explain. Um, so I'm Stu Evans. Uh, I'm responsible for our performance and improvement team in health, safety and wellbeing. Uh, just a brief explanation of what the team do. So it's kind of focused in two areas, closing the title, performance and improvement. So from an improvement perspective, our principal focus is around home safe and well. Um, I think you've probably talked, I've heard it mentioned at least twice today, which is good. And I suspect you've been talking around it for a while. Um, but uh, the design of home safe and well, the next generations, uh, all the aspirations that we kind of set out in there all sit within my team and, and the team's work. Um, but probably a big focus for us, and we'll, we'll end up talking about it at some point, is the whole learning organisation ethos. So I think that really ties in nicely to, to the invite to today's call. Uh, also responsible for improvement projects. So some of the improvement projects we've run include uh, work on incursions and IPVs, uh, the automated IPV project, which I'm sure some people have heard about. And eventually to kick off early next year, um, some work with academia. We're sponsoring two PhDs. Um, on human plant interface and accident investigation. So, um, yeah, really interesting things to be involved in. We're also the lead for the safety cultural maturity work uh, that we do for the business, uh, safety communication. So that's where you see kind of home safe and well plastered all over stuff internally and externally, I'm pleased to say, uh, and our portfolio of projects that we do within the whole director, sorry, whole division that um, my team are responsible for being um, managing. The other part of the, the team is, is Nat's team. So this is the, the small but perfectly formed team that she leads, which is around safety data, the whole reporting and analysis perspective, uh, our monthly performance report that gets sent to the board and the exec and versions to supply chain, um, our safety alerts, uh, our blue stars, all of the work that we do around our accident and incident reporting system, AirsWeb and, and its predecessors, um, the front end to that, the rear end to that, the, the management of kind of training and queries around how to use airs. Uh, the team are also responsible for our, our trade union forum or our trade union health and safety forum. So the relationship with our trade union colleagues, which is always very interesting. And not to underplay correspondence and, and freedom of information requests, which make up a, another small but important part of what the team do. 
So it's uh, it's a diverse group, uh, a really, really interesting one, I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to be part of. And um, I think the, the ask to come and talk today was originally around two subjects. And I know, Doug, did uh, was it either yourself or one of your colleagues put together some, some questions that you wanted to pose as we didn't have a presentation per se? Uh, we did, yes, yes. Um, do you want... Uh... Do you want us to run through those? Or do yeah, we can either go through those or um, um, hopefully that overview gave you a, a bit of a, um, an understanding of what the team do. I mean, I'm, I'm a direct report to, to Mark Bayard, so Richard uh, Wilson, who you know, and, and Glyn was on the call if he's not already, and people like Bob uh, Watson and my peer group. So that's how we fit in. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. OK, could I ask Tim? Do you, would you be able to, to, to run through the questions as if, if I, uh, I'm, I'm, I might struggle to get your presentation back at the moment? Right, let me. Can everyone hear me? I'm showing us on unmuted, but. Yep, can hear you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So I think just as Stu said, sort of everything airs web sort of sits uh, in, in our team. So I think we'll be sort of steered by by you to answer any questions you've got. We do have something um, that we can show you with regards to sort of an example of the data that we we put out of Airs Web. So we can happily share that as we go through as well. That, that would be excellent, yes. Yeah. So sorry, Tim, go on. Okay. Okay, well the the brief I say brief, there was about 14 of them. The questions we came up with, what information is available without specific login to Airs Web? Because um, individually, we get obviously allocated via HEPMs to specific projects. But um, future projects, information that we might find um, that we want to share or think about with our design reviews. OK. Um, Adam, do you want to share the, what, what you've done on the screen? And I'll answer that one. So um, it's a fairly quick answer. And it probably the answer is very little. So when you are allocated to a scheme that is what you are restricted in seeing any airs web data that that solely relates to that scheme um, what my team are able to do is obviously span across the whole supply chain or the whole organization um, it's difficult in us sharing that access because obviously there's sensitive information within airs web and there's data protection and there's things that we can't share but um, we are more than happy to sort of share what we can with you to sort of help you and enable your work going forwards. Um, if, if I let Adam run through this, this gives a bit of an idea as to what sort of data we can pull out of it. And then hopefully that will answer some of your Airs Web questions as well. And it, let's see whether or not this sort of mirrors what, what you were hoping to um, to be able to see if that makes sense. Thanks. Hey Ryan. Um, yeah, so we were, it was sort of said that we were coming to speak to you guys. So we did a quick look on what we have in Airs Web just as a really, really broad level that, that may help you. And you guys specifically mentioned that you were looking at design or engineering related failures. Um, so we have quite a complex uh, decision tree in the background of our root cause analysis model. Um, a very small branch of it is related to engineering and design. Um, obviously, because we didn't have a, a very specific steer on, on precisely what you were looking for, this is going to be much more of a, um, a broad, broad stroke overview. So we'll just be specifically looking at when the root cause of engineering or design related failure had been selected on an incident within Airsweb. So this is what we're looking at. Over the past 12 months, there's been 850 incidents where engineering or design related failure has been identified as a contributing factor to, towards one of the incidents. On the left hand side here, you can see our multiple departments where we've got the traffic officers and Highways England office staff taking the vast majority of the incidents where they've highlighted engineering or design related failure as a contributing cause and much, much smaller number when related to operations. We can break those out and have a look at what kind of events um, are being flagged as having engineering or design related failure um, 
contributory causes. Um, and as you can see, it's largely around assets in both both um, departments. So what we're going to do now is go on and start looking at other ways that we can have a look into this data without just having to necessarily pull out all 850 and just, just read through um, the investigation summaries. So we can have a look at where they are or are not causing significant issue. So one of our soft ways we can look at our information is by its event type, um, which is a, a soft implication of its severity. So I've ordered, organized them here and you can see we go all the way from an undesired circumstance where there was a set of circumstances where something untoward could have happened, but they were stopped before they proceeded all, all the way up to a personal injury. And obviously the, the ultimate one at the top there potentially being a riddle of fatality. So this is the, the full spectrum. What we are seeing here is the Highways England staff overall are producing a, a, a much more normalised curve. If you think, think back to the more um, archaic severity distribution models um, where you have the, the pyramid, um, this implies that Highways England potentially have a bit more of a grasp and an understanding of when they are looking at causes of incidents. They're able to identify when design related issues are are, are present um, and currently on supply chain it's a, it's a little less of, of the distribution we'd like to see however it should be noted that they aren't mandated to report um, near misses or undesireds um, unless they are high potentials which likely explains a little bit of this skew here. What we can also do is do some um, sem semantic analysis and start having a look at what people have been typing in the free text, which is always usually pretty handy. On the left hand side, these are the most common phrases and words that have come out for Highways England. This is in what happened, what was being done at the time and throughout the investigation. And on the right hand side is what we'd be looking for in um, supply chain. So um, one of the better fu functions of this is I I'm a data analyst, so this doesn't necessarily mean that much to me. All I can tell you is these are the phrases and these are the terms that are coming out significantly more over the past 850 incidents than any others. And this is the split between Highways England and the supply chain. Um, so what, what we're looking here is basically just giving you a flavour of, of what we can pull out, what we're able to do. Um, but the biggest thing we can ask is just for um, a really accurate steer of what you're trying to, to to look for and also if there are more specific things that you'd like to record we can start ad adding more specific um, kind of events or we can add different fields in our investigations and things like that that are able to be selected by the users so we can start really really dialing this into you guys we've recently done it with um, structural safety um, where we've been able to sort of tweak things so there are a little bit more bespoke to, to them while still being accessible to the wider user base. Um, yeah, so that's that's pr pretty much it. Obviously, there's all the the other sides of things we we can pull together rates, and, you know, x amount of incidents of this nature per hour in the northwest or for Balfour BT or for, for for whichever you want. Any of the generic sort of reporting is also obviously pr pretty straightforward once it's in Azure. Okay. Adam, Tim, is it, I'm, it's, it's, I'm conscious of time, uh, and Doug. Um, maybe if we could have some questions just raised, would people put their hands up and raise questions uh, for the next couple of minutes? Yes. While we got the people around this virtual table, Martin's got a question. He's got his hand up. Yeah, I'm a. Uh, uh a data analyst as well, or have been in the past, uh, and I uh, looked at the data in Area 14 for over a 10 year period. Um, the uh, problem with Airs Web, um, and it's why I raised the question earlier about um, whether you're going to use an app, uh, is the, getting the data into the system. It was so complicated that you, you couldn't grab all the data that you're after, and all you're focusing on was the uh, severe, severe incidents at the top, whereas a lot of the good data was in the near misses. So more yes. Yeah. So so um, work towards 
streamlining our data capture process is cur currently uh, underway and we are striving towards getting an app sorted that's um, going to be a much more or less uh, frictionless reporting for our users. I think there's a question from Paul. Yeah, just echoing what I put on the uh, on the chat. Um, having 850 instance clusters engineering or design related failure sounded stunning when I saw that, given the amount of information we get on design related failures. But actually looking at what that category includes, um, I think we really need to seriously think about splitting what an engineering failure is from what a design related failure is because things like vehicle failure and so on is nothing to do with the design process. So maybe yeah, yeah. we need to have a look at that. Yeah, absolutely. That's something we can definitely do. Um, so that tree at the moment that I showed you a um, co couple of pages back. Um, the it, one on slide three is, is the one I'm kind of looking at. Asset uh, failure, damage, unsafe condition. It's not a design issue. Um, well, what 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 right here, the, the kind of event is the ultimate overall incident that that occurred. Um, so someone being hit by a moving or falling object, the overall incident that occurred there was almost certainly, you know, a, a potential personal injury. And what led part of the whole mixture of in, uh, factors that led to that may have been an aspect of a design related failure of a piece of equipment. Um, same with the service strike electricity, it could potentially be that the cat generator that they were using to scan the grounds is not has, hasn't been designed properly. Um, yeah, it, it's, I'm sorry, I don't that, think that, you've got the that's data the level of understanding it, I think on this on this Adam that from a from our designer's point of view, we're not talking about how someone designs a, a JCB or how someone designs a cat. We're talking about how someone designs a road. Okay. That's that's kind of our and so from this group we look we're looking at design related failures where the designer should have done something to eliminate a risk or reduce the risk before it got to construction stage. That's what we class as a design related failure where we haven't done our job as designers. Highway um, civil engineering structures designers. Yeah, and then and the problem the problem we have is so we, we did a presentation earlier around recent safety alerts so we, we analyze those safety alerts the, the information is relatively limited in, in terms of information we get because it's usually the one pager that's issued out to to uh, the supply chain um, and it quite often doesn't go into the level of detail to say well actually the, the the root cause behind this was the fact that there was a problem with the design so for so for example uh, you know a big piece of plant went over um, because the slope that was designed was too steep or, or access wasn't thought about. Um, so it, one of the areas that we're looking at is sort of what we call red line boundary, so that when the design is being developed, is there sufficient working area um, to actually allow, you know, for buildability, to allow that particular scheme, project, whatever, to, to, to be built, to get the plant in to do the, the work. And, you know, it, it, yes, there might be a driver of error, but the fact may be that um, the actual surrounds there, there was, you know, was inadequate. The growing conditions weren't uh, weren't suitable. You know, there could be a whole series of things that the design team haven't considered as part of the, their design process, which is fundamental to CDM, construction design and management, which, uh, and the role of the principal designer and designers to make sure that we are thinking about those issues. So it's it, it, it's uh, having having pulled all that information together, we try and categorize it, but it's quite difficult because it doesn't go to that level of detail. You know, it doesn't go into sort of, yeah, you know, vehicle fell over. Well, you know, what what was the root cause behind that? Was it, you know, was it a steep batter? Was it ground condition? Was it um, you know, accessibility, everything? So, you know, as an example of, of, of the kind of issues that we are trying to learn from uh, by analyzing safety alerts. Doug, I think we can, it's Stu Evans here, we can probably um, take it offline and, and, and have um, a more helpful conversation, I think, around what, what's possible. Um, we, we can play with the data in any way, shape or form, whether it's the right level of detail, as somebody said earlier, I don't know. Totally get the point you said about um, how we can influence design and you're right. Um, we need to be working harder and smarter on, on the lessons learned and, and how that applies to everybody at every phase where that's applicable. Uh, I think there's some internal work to do there as well, which I'm sure Richard would acknowledge. So, I, yeah, I take on board what you said. I'm, I'm not sure if this is necessarily the right environment to be able to 
um, you know, take all the feedback and run with it. It's uh, happy to be here, of course, but yeah, there's this is the first outing of it, isn't it? So I think there's there's probably a lot to go at. Okay, I think Rich has got his hand up. <laughs> I have. It's twelve twenty nine, and once again we haven't finished the agenda, so that's my fault because I agreed it with Doug. So everything's my fault today because I was late for the meeting. So I apologise. We will send out. Firstly, thank you very much, Stu, Natalie and Adam. I think now people know who you are. Your e email boxes will fill. As Natalie's put on the chat, if people want support, please use the AIRS web uh, address, the email address, and then the team divvy up the sort of work. OK, I'd like to thank everybody for joining this meeting and their contributions. Um, I was meant to be doing an update on this supply chain maturity matrix. We will send out the slides with the, the notes, but thank you very much for the volunteers for the next phase of testing. You are guinea pigs. We will test you. This is the last meeting of 2020, so I must personally thank everybody for all their contributions, in particular Doug, who keeps me on the straight and narrow. Um, Thank you very, very much. I wish you all the best for the festive season. I know Mr Evans doesn't celebrate it, so I won't apply to him. Uh, and, you know, look after yourselves in these challenging times. I suspect in January when we have our next meeting, it will be a virtual meeting and we'll probably need yet another big tin of biscuits to keep everybody concentrated and focused. But the contributions you've made, the progress we've made is good. I think you know, what we can learn from incidents has to be high on our agenda. Otherwise, we're going to go around in circles and never improve the performance of designers and the people constructing the sites, but also the people who have to maintain and operate. And I think, you know, maintenance and operation, as Andrew always keeps banging the drum about, is a very, very important aspect of designers. It's the whole life cycle. So, Doug, have I done everything right this time? Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, very succinct. Yes. <laughs> um, so yes, the next meeting is on the twenty-first uh, of January. Uh, we will send invites out, um, pull together minutes, uh, the comments, uh, the chat um, chat room, uh, and we'll feed back to uh, both Stuart and the team and uh, Jason in terms of. Um, the discussions we've just had recently so uh, so yes thank you Richard the, just Paul is that oh, has got his hand up <laughs> have I missed at the point at which we got told what's happened with the update on the HECDM docs it's Mr Scott had to disappear off the call he sent me a text message earlier he will provide a presentation in January but the pro progress is good for our internal documentation so well we will we got any idea when that might be coming out Yes, it's meant to be out at the beginning of next year. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And he's and he's already volunteered, and I have a text message to say that he'll do a presentation on it, so he'll be first up. All right. Okay. And, I, and I suppose Paul, Paul, just to add to that, uh, well, you, you're aware that GG106 is being developed to replace EM105. Yeah. Um, we were going to do a quick update on that. Um, it, it was, I suppose, AOB. Um, and that's being uh, pulled together by uh, Dave Townsend. Uh, and it's currently, there's a, there is a draft document for everybody else, and it's currently being peer, re peer reviewed with oh, a target God. of the 17th of December to feedback to. Yeah. Um, that, uh, that's kind of where I was coming from in terms of how can we review that if we're not quite sure what the, what the CDM docs from HE are going to be, so we don't know what the overlap and interrelationship is between the two. But there, there are internal procedures. Okay. Okay, I think I think that's the important thing to remember. There's the outward facing stuff, the GGs, etc., the MMB, but then there's our internal health and safety management system for our people. Okay, and we will share that once it's it's in the fit state. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, because I appreciate people have got other meetings to go to or even lunch dates. Okay, thank you. And God bless. Yep. Thanks, everybody, and uh, Bye. speak again and. Yes, have a great, uh, great Christmas. Thanks. Hopefully, Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Cheers now. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.